Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsfile. The quest for macroeconomic stability is on. No doubt there's a massive economic crisis on our hands and it's time for expenditure cuts, haircuts and other cuts are expected while the IMF, World Bank and Government of Ghana engages in debt sustainability. Analysis which has been described as nothing to write home about. But hopefully a deal that will restore and sustain our macroeconomic stability will be reached. In fact, the target is that some form of the agreement will be fast-tracked and we're expecting a reflection in the 2023 budget to be presented in November. Already, doubts have been cast on the visibility of that target, but we expect a Ghana miracle out of the 10-day talks with the IMF. Well, in the midst of that also, there are growing concerns about a possible financial loss of up to $1.5 billion in the deal between GNPC and Genser Energy. And it appears there's more, even though government says the claims could be misleading. These are vexed matters that get attention on your most authoritative news analysis program, Newsfile. We're live on Joy News, Joy FM, 99.7 FM, Love, 99.5 FM in Kumasi. On DSTV on Channel 421, Go TV is 144. We're on radio, television, and online. That's myjoyonline.com. We encourage your active participation via our various social media platforms. Here on Newsfile, Ghana's interest is always put first. After this short break, I'll introduce my guest to you. I am MFA Apao. Welcome to Newsfile. Please stay. You're welcome back to Newsfile here on Joy News, also on Joy 99.7 FM. And Newsfile, as always, is brought to you by Bank of Africa, as strong as a group, as close as a partner. We're sponsored by MTN, everywhere you go. Star Assurance, your solid partner. Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. We have Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years. Fernat Ghana, think wood, think Fernat. Duraplast, how you get your water matters. Remember, where Duraplast goes, water flows. St. Thomas Eye Hospital, providing excellence in eye care. We have Haptel, everything you and my way insurance dial star 165 hash on the mtn just to join and today like i said we'll be talking about the imf deal the talks that's ongoing we have 10 days we've done five days already and like the finance minister says we are looking forward to a ghana miracle hopefully to get a deal that will be reflected in our 2023 budget that's in november and doubts have been cast already on that. And to start that discussion uh, today for us will be the ranking member on Mines and Energy Committee, John Ginapo, is my guest uh, today on Newsfile. We also have Dr. Prisla Chumesi Bafo. She's with the Department of Economics of the University of Ghana. And then also we have the President, Bankers Association of Ghana, Mr. John Iwa, both joining us via Zoom. Mr. Abu Ginapo, join me in the studio. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Newsfile. I want to test your microphones to be sure that we're good. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. But before we get into the IMF talks, of course, there's a lot happening on the front of illegal mining, issues about Galamse. We'll get to talk about it. I'll get your preliminary comments on that before we get talking proper about the economy. And that will be right after this break. Please stay. Thanks for staying with us here on Newsfile. And like I said before the break, we'll touch on briefly on issues about Galamse. We know that this week, uh, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister, Mr. Samo Jinapo, has been up and about. Um, he's been to the Ashanti region, touring some Galamse sites or illegal mining sites, and he's been describing it as devastating. And some have wondered, you see, now realizing that um, the impact of Galamse is actually devastating. Whilst at it, we know that we are coming up with Destruction for Gold, that documentary that's been put together by my colleague Erastos Asari Donko is airing on Monday here on the Joy News channel, uh, revealing some issues happening. And we know currently that there's some prospecting or mining in the Nimre Forest, which is supposed to be a forest reserve. How did Akunta Mining Company Limited, a company that we now know belongs to Chairman Woon to me, the regional chairman, that's the Ashanti regional chairman of the NPP. He's been speaking about it, mentioning that he has a license uh, to be prospecting or mining in the Nimri forest, which is supposed to be a forest reserve. And just today and just this morning, our team in the Ashanti region has given us 
files indicating that the Asantehene Otu Forsei II has been speaking about the illegal mining situation. This is about the second or third time we're hearing him on this. He's insisting that chiefs cannot be accused of allowing illegal mining to thrive when licenses are issued without recourse to traditional authorities. That's the situation he's raising. He's also talking about questioning the failure of the security agencies to successfully fight illegal mining in the country. Let's hear from the Asante Hene, Osun Fosei to the second. When you come to Galamse, so that is an albatross on our head. It's rather unfortunate that this happened this way. Uh, Ghana was known as the Gold Coast and therefore it was known. But during that time, uh, it wasn't like the Galamse that we are talking about. Uh, many other ones people were doing it. hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It was there. But unfortunately, it's got into a point where people are now <coughs> using equipment that and all that and, and doesn't care about, they don't care about the environment or anything. But the question is, who is in control of that security around the area? Up, 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 From the up. district level to the highest level. We are all talking about Galamse. Mm -hmm. The government set up uh, this, uh, the, 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 a military police to do it. Why have we not been able to stop it? No. So why? Up, 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 up. There's the point. Why haven't we been able to stop it? If you create a, a system where we say we will stop it, to the extent that the president says, I've put my presidency on the line, and yet it is going on, then to me, something is wrong somewhere. Sure. So we need to review why this is happening. Polluting our waters. And case in point is when I came back and hear that a Chinese woman who had who was supposedly deported is back in this country also doing Galamse again. Who allowed them so, to come? Is it that our borders are porous? Up, 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 or what? <coughs> so what happened? So, and people know who are doing the Galamse. They know the people are working there in the communities with those people. Unfortunately, unemployment may be the problem. Fine, but that is not to say that we have to destroy environments. So. Unemployment could be a problem. Fine, so people in communities will say, I don't have any job to do and therefore, but that's not the alternative. So it's something that is facing all of us that we need to find out what, up, 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 what went wrong. But to me, why can't Galamse be stopped? Because I'm sure people are also involved that they know and have some authority somewhere that I, I don't think that should be the case. So. so <laughs> But if they go there and meet the Galapse people, with gold and all those things, that, uh, what happens? Where's the gold? Where's the money? Who is taking it? So let's face reality. So, so that you, you, the concession or whatever it is is given by them, by by the authorities in Accra. The chiefs don't give concessions to people. The chiefs are there, and the people come. They say that we've gotten a document from Accra to say that we've been given a license to come and. And mine, who consulted the chief for him to even be able to supervise where he's going? So, and the constitution says the minerals and that is for is being held in trust for the people by the president. So, whoever gave that person the license to go and mine should be responsible to supervise that the, the degradation of the of the land. Asante Hene Otunfo say to the second, they're speaking during that Ketsi call on him by the U.S. ambassador at the Mainshia Palace. That's the concern. Chiefs cannot be blamed entirely who were giving these licenses. We've heard from uh, Chairman Wuntumi saying that his license uh, to prospect in the Nimue Forest spans all the way to 2035. How is that possible? We've been told that um, he's been instructed or we've heard the Lands and Natural Resources Minister indicate that he should halt his activities in there, that's a contamining. What then happens? Does it stop there? But we can hear from Samuel Abujinapo during his tour also of the Ashanti region. But for all of us as citizens, as uh, policy makers, and as stakeholders in this fight, how uh, an operation like this in the heart of the forest and in the uh, far away uh, areas of our country can go on without notice by 
the police, the, the chiefs, the local political leadership, assembly people, um, you know, the district chief executive, for example. And I should dare say, even the inspector division of the Minerals Commission here. And these are questions that I, as minister, I'm going to be uh, seeking answers for. How is it the case that such an operation can be mounted and such level of devastation can happen? What against illegal mining can only be won if it's a collective action, if, it, if we all collectively put our, our weights and put our support behind the fight. And I've made this point over and over again. Mining with the greatest of respect in all humility and modesty is never conducted in an office. Mining is conducted in the countryside. It's conducted out there. And if it's conducted out there, the people who are responsible for the various jurisdictions in the country, with the greatest of respect, are the people who should uh, come to grips with this matter. But there it is. So that's um, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister um, recently in the Ashanti region. Uh, just to, we know that he's summoned five regional ministers to talk about the situation where we have this illegal mining situation prevalent. We've heard about this exchange of gunfire um, in, with impunity actually happening right here in Ghana. We are told also in the eastern region that some arrests have been made, about 15 arrests from a police statement that we are seeing so far. What really is happening? We've had Operation Halt, a number Operation Vanguard, a number of operations just to deal with illegal mining. What really is the problem? We've heard from the Asante Hene raising concerns that chiefs cannot be blamed entirely because they are not issuing these licenses. Let me come to my guests now for their preliminary comments on this. And as we go on, we will take your comments as well on this illegal mining situation. Then we can get into the IMF conversation and then the GNPC scandal. Uh, there's more happening there that we need to unearth as well, right here on News File. So for obvious reasons, I'll start with uh, Dr. Prisla Chumisi uh, on this. Uh, then we can, we know that there are economic drivers, of course, that's leading to this illegal mining situation. But should that take precedent over um, our environment, really? That's the, that's the concern. Thank you, Amafa. Good morning and good morning to your listeners once again. Um, indeed, when it comes to rent-seeking behavior, like we find in the mining sector, it is a difficult fight to win unless um, there are strict rules and measures that are put in place, not necessarily um, ad hoc measures once in a while campaign against it. Because like the minister indicated, the people that are prospecting for gold and all that, they are in the hinterland. So you cannot be in offices regulating such activities. So we need a national consensus, a stronger fight against the menace. Because indeed, when you look at some of the, the scenes um, in, in videos and pictures, it's like a war zone. And you see that the people that are in, engaging this um, the returns to the hazardous activities they are involved in are quite high for those that are engaging in those activities. But it comes at the detriment of the whole society because as a society, I mean, we are losing our water bodies. It takes so long, number of years to reclaim these lands that have been left in such devastating manner. And so for me, I think that we need to, um, as a country, uh, be more stricter on the rules, punitive measures. Um, and I see that the police will be arresting um, some of the people, but indeed, when you look at these people, you see that these are the young men that have been hired or are doing the galamse themselves. We need a few big ways within in there to serve as a deterrent to others. I believe that if a number of people have been jailed, have been punished, for these activities, influential people, it will serve as a, a good signal to deter um, the many that are involved in these activities um, on, the, in, on the other side of the country. And also, I mean, the other bit is that, yes, whilst we are doing this, how are we, um, uh, how is the system coming out with policies to generate alternative livelihoods for people that have been involved in these activities? Oh, yes, so these are a national consensus that needs to be built um, for a whole agenda to battle this because 
certainly the rate we are going is not sustainable. But with this fight so far, over the period, with what you've seen, I know you've mentioned how difficult it is, but do you see some level of seriousness in wanting to actually deal with this situation? To be honest, to, to, the, to the extent that the president puts his uh, presidency on board, I believe that the, the, the success stories are not many, given that we are still seeing what we see. So the question we need to access the people the president has appointed in positions of authority to uh, manage these activities, what are they doing? And if we are not getting um, results, why are they still in position, for example? I think that um, people must be held accountable. And for that matter, um, when we do that, then um, it, it serves as a, as, a, as a signal for people who are in the bid to prospect people who are um, being encouraged to move into the business and all that. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that the system has achieved much. Mm. Mr. Wa, let me come to you. I know we are all about, or mostly about, building our strong financial institutions amongst others, but looking at our water bodies, looking at the situation in terms of our fight against illegal mining, I'm sure you've seen the exchange of gunfire. I missed it. We are told that there have been some arrests amongst others, but really, from where you sit, what do you see when it comes to our fight against illegal mining? You sit on the financial sector. Are you happy with what you see? Thank you very much, Alifa. Um, it's sad and, uh, when, you, when you see the images and the, uh, the news stories, you cannot but you know, bow your, your head down in, almost in shape. It's sad that um, a classic case of the personal interest of a few people um, overriding the entire national interest. And it is sad that uh, these few people have succeeded so much to more or less conscript the entire security apparatus of the country in a manner that it's not able to act. And when you hear of reports that um, some of these uh, illegal miners are being protected by people who are supposed to be arresting them, it goes to get to the point that we are not ready to fight the fight. What we do as a country is as these matters come up, we rush quickly just to quell the news, and then afterwards, we go back to business as usual. We can't deal with Galamse Menes with business as usual. It needs concerted effort, commitment, dedication, and people who are truly in words and in deeds willing and able to act to, to, to stop this from happening. And when people talk about Galam says that, oh, uh, the, the future of generations, uh, you know, is being sacrificed. I, I, I say it's not the future of generations. The, we who are alive now, we may not even see that future. If the pace at which the environment is being degraded pursues or goes on at this pace, in our lifetime, we will see it's direct impact, negative impact. And I'll give you a short story. Um, and growing up, um, I spent some time in a village in the Ashanti region called Enyinasu. Mm -hmm. As we entered the village, there used to be a big river before the village and another river just up as we exit the village. After over 35 to 40 years, I had not been there. And one day, on my, on my route to an event in uh, the Brown House region at the time, I decided to pass through that village to see how uh, things are panned out in the, in, the, in the environment where I spent some, a few years. I entered the village without knowing that I was in the village. And when I stopped and asked about the river, they said, oh, this river has disappeared long ago. Mm -hmm. So I thought as I exited the town, I was going to see the other river. When I got there, it had also disappeared. Even during the rainy season, there is no river there. So in our lifetime, in one village, you've lost two river sources. If we do not deal with this, with all the energies and the economic power that as a state we have, the security that we have, it is an existential issue. We must tackle it at its back. We need to tackle it from the roots. We don't have to respond just to new stories. And um, they say in, in performance management, that what gets measured gets done. And I 
I support what uh, my, my colleague panelist just men mentioned. If there is no consequence for the things that have happened, there's nothing that's going to happen to change the course that as a country we are on now. People must get fired. If you are a DCE and in your locality there's illegal mining going on, you must lose your job. It's as simple as that. Mm. And we, we like to scratch surfaces of our problems without dealing with the underlying issue. That there are too many big men in this country, big men in court, who supposedly can pick a phone and everything stops. We need to get to the point where those big men are made to answer for their ills and sins to the country. It is appalling the way and manner we've allowed this. This should not be news. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one week action, and I'm sure all the perpetrators, the people who are destroying the future of this country and our livelihood of this country, um, we, you know, um, they'll, they'll just disappear in a matter of a week or a month if we are serious about it. Look at this image. And it's, it's so sad mm. that people can have the infantry to tell us that they have permits to mine in a forest reserve. What kind of country is this? It's, well, it's, 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 the more you think about it, the more you become, you know, almost apprehensive. And, and, and it's so, 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 so sad. Well, you assurances know, have been giving. Uh, we've been told about measures that have been put in place. Why it's not working and why it's not stopping and why our water bodies are not clearing remains a mystery. But thankfully, uh, the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee is with me uh, in the studios. Mr. John Jinapo, thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us once again. So you sit where you sit. You see it all. At least you interact with those who are supposed to be dealing with this particular situation. What really is hampering the process of dealing with illegal mining? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think that <clears throat> it's a major, major problem. Normally, when you have a situation where such minerals lead to some significant levels of revenue, there is the tendency and the temptation for people to move in there. And that is even why the state, particularly those in authority, ought to be determined, measured, and ensure that they fight this canker. I think all of us have come to agree that this illegal mining activity is causing a serious problem for us as a nation. If you look at our river bodies, our forest cover, and I even heard the Minister of Information indicate that it could impact exports of cocoa. Mm -hmm. Don't forget our cocoa volumes have already reduced from about 1 million to 680,000. Partly because people are cutting down their cocoa trees for illegal mining activities. So it's a major, major area. You might get some quick money today, but then the consequence going forward and sustainability is a major issue. The buck starts with the president, and that is why the president himself said he's putting his job on the line. Nobody compelled him. He himself, realizing how serious the issue is, told the people of Ghana that he's putting his job on the line. The result so far has been very, very appalling for me. Uh, the president hasn't achieved anything significant. But you asked a legitimate question. How do you deal with it? The only way to deal with it, in my opinion, is the president to show leadership by going after his people. Mm. There's ample evidence to suggest and to confirm that some top hierarchy within the MPP are engaged in this illegal activity. Are they? They are. You just cited Akunta Mining. And he says that he has a prospecting license till 2035. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's shocking. This is the law. Just a moment. Minerals and Mining Act 703, Section 35 says, A prospecting license shall be granted for initial period not exceeding three years. Says he's been renewing it. And, uh, no, but if you, and the, and the renewal, extension of the time, the holder of a prospecting license may at any time, but not later than three months before the expiration of the license, apply in the form that may be prescribed to the minister for an extension of the term of the prospecting license, subject to 38, three, for a period not more than three years. Yes. Mm. So how can you renew it till 2035? I mean, this is the law. The law says that you can't go beyond three years. And even when you go to 38, it says that the acreage or the land size ought to be reducing going forward. So how come Wood to me is able to acquire a prospecting license 
That expires in 2035. There may be more wound to means out there. A lot of them. We get a lot of reports. And we issued a statement, I think, two weeks ago, when we heard that he was degrading the forest in Samna Boy. Mm -hmm. Now, go to the minister's own statement. This is the press release from the minister, 30th of September 2022, issued by the Public Relations, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. It is clear, the statement confirms that what Akonta Mining, owned by Chama Wontimi, was doing there was illegal. They've asked him to halt activities. No, the first thing is that what he was doing was illegal. Mm -hmm. So, he's breached the law. There's no doubt about that. Because the fact that you have a prospecting license doesn't mean you can just move into the forest and start degrading it. You need other permits, like environmental permits and other permits or licenses before you can move in. So clearly, there's some blatant disregard for the law, like some of my colleagues are saying, by some people who feel untouchable. Let's face it, but for the fact that you're my wound to me, was the Ashanti regional chairman of the MPP. Could he have moved into the forest and, and start degrading it the way he was doing? And you, the media, but he started kept this talking way about back. it. But yes. the concern is he started way back. He that didn't just start point. when he became the regional chairman of the NPP. So for you to say that because he's a regional chairman, that's how come he's been left off the hook. Some um, action of a sort has been taking now, we're told. Is it enough? Is not enough? You expect more to be done? You would recall that President Mahmoud's major problem with Chairman Wuntumi was when he attempted to stop him from these illegal activities. And he publicly went after President Mahama and stated that President Mahama was preventing him from earning his daily bread. So you could see a deliberate attempt by the then government mm. to deal with this situation. I'm saying that this is a new phenomenon, especially with this forest reserve. We're talking of illegal mining. Now we're talking of illegal mining moving into forest reserves. Mm -hmm. It's a serious matter. So I'm saying the president must demonstrate that he's indeed committed. This government must show commitment by dealing with their own people. Mm -hmm. If they go arresting the small, small ones, the small fishes, whilst your own men are blatantly disregarding the law and moving into forest reserves and degrading the forest, you are sending the wrong signal. For me, this is a litmus test. There's evidence that what this company has done is illegal. They moved into the forest, degraded the forest without authority. And so I expect that this government and their ministers would take this on, use this as a test case, prosecute them, so that we would know mm. that government is indeed committed against illegal money. Anything short of this, for me, it would just be scratching the surface to be mere rhetoric, and it doesn't demonstrate or confirm that this government is committed to fighting the canker. Look, this Aquanta mining, he's been there for a long time. It's not yesterday, it's not from his own, yesterday. From his I have been working with some of your sister stations. I've been granting interviews. I've seen videos. Summer Text has been complaining. The chiefs have been complaining. And the man feels that he's above the law, he's big, he has some political weight, and so he can do what he wants. You, you but, but the likes of you, you have a committee, you're a ranking member on a key committee that's supposed to help with this fight. We hear you talk about it, and it appears beyond the news items, nothing much really happens. You have the powers, why are you not using it? Look, let's call a spade a spade. When it comes to punitive measures, when it comes to prosecution, it's not parliament that does it. Of it's course, it's not. But you, you have the power to force the hand. Mm -hmm. And responsibility in terms of oversight. It is parliament. And we've hauled the minister responsible for this sector, uh, lawyer Samuel Abujina, for several years before our committee, before parliament, even in the chamber, to put him to stress test and all so that. So Pierce is just, is just hauling him before a committee, and, and that's it. Nothing so therefore, happens. the question is that, what can parliament do? Mm -hmm. You voted us to go and represent you. I'm telling you what we have been doing. If you think that there's something in particular, something specific that parliament ought to do that we are not doing, put it out here. Mm. And I promise you we'll take it up. I know that within the remit of the constitution and within the powers that parliament has, we have done a very, very good job in terms of advocacy, oversight responsibility, giving directives, 
We've done everything we can. But the box stops with the president. Okay. It's the president who has the mandate and the power to stop this. He controls the security apparatus. He controls our budget. He appoints the ministers. He appoints the attorney general. He can institute prosecution through the attorney general. And so let us hold the man who has the power and the responsibility to stop this. When the president leads, then all of us can support him. But if the president doesn't show commitment, if he doesn't fight this head on, don't hold MPs responsible for the failures of the president. I'm clear about this, and I'm, and I'm very, very clear about what I'm saying. Mm. Well, we've heard from the traditional rulers. They are also uh, shifting the blame. They mentioned that they can't be blamed entirely for this because they don't issue the licenses, among others. But this is a fight that we ought to continue to deal with. And on Monday, uh, here on the Joy News Channel, we're bringing you Destruction for Gold, that documentary put together by Erasta Sasari Donko. You ought to catch it, and then we can all help in that fight against um, illegal mining. And we'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll get into the IMF talks. It's day five already. Debt sustainability on the path to get that $3 billion loan um, facility and hoping that it would actually reflect in the uh, November. That's the 2023 budget. What really happens? We've talked about the seven pillars that are outlined. We'll be taking a look at them right here on Newsfile. Please stay. Overall, our growth outturn of 3.4%, an impressive 4.8% in Q1 and Q2 of 2022 respectively, coupled with modest improvements in our fiscal position, suggests our economy is gradually on the upswing despite the numerous shocks we have faced over the past two years. These figures demonstrate that in spite of recent challenges, there has been economic growth modest as a gains so far may be. This progress gives us a solid foundation to confront the challenges ahead. Undoubtedly, global risks remain on the horizon, including a strengthening US dollar and higher interest rates, which negatively affect external borrowing. This development is exerting enormous pressure on our balance of payment position, and thus the need for us to expedite engagement with the IMF. Within this context, government is finalizing its post-COVID-19 economic program as a domestic blueprint to engage the IMF. This document has already benefited from input from key stakeholders, including civil society, social partners, labor, employers, and faith-based organizations, academia, industry professionals, and the leadership of parliament. Additional stakeholder engagements will be held to solicit further inputs for the program. Having a sustainable debt path is a prerequisite for the IMF program. Therefore, the IMF World Bank and the Ghana team are currently undertaking a debt sustainability analysis to inform the program negotiations. In addition, the IMF and government team are working to update the medium-term macrofiscal framework to inform IMF program design. Also, the government team and the IMF team are discussing policy measures and structural reforms proposing an economic program aimed at addressing the economic challenges facing the country towards restoring and sustaining macroeconomic stability, fiscal and debt sustainability, as well as promoting durable and inclusive growth and social protection. We simply have not reached any agreement with the fund on the parameters of any debt operation as we are in the process of completing the debt sustainability analysis. Government shall continue to actively engage all stakeholders in a clear and transparent manner as we seek to fast track the IMF negotiation process. Ghana needs a viable domestic financial system to support its development program, especially in these three years of limited access to international capital markets. Therefore, everything must and will be done to protect our financial sector. And there must be room for a win-win conversation through extensive stakeholder engagement with both our domestic and external investors. Ghana has always had a collaborative approach with its partners, and we shall, I'm confident, come out of an historic arrangement. 
This is a government that protected the savings of 4.6 million Ghanaian depositors with the reform of the banking and financial sector. Even in our early days, we owe it to the economy and Ghanaians to keep protecting it. The sanctity and the well-functioning of the financial system is sacrosanct, and we need the support and trust of all Ghanaians to deliver this. Let us join hands to get this done. The great Celtic miracle in Ireland in the 80s was a result of such collaboration, especially with labor, and we shall also be blessed with the Ghana miracle. Well, so that's um, Ghana's finance minister, Ken Ufoyata, just this week giving us updates on our economic situation, also on the talks with IMF. And then you also heard Gary Rice there briefly um, there speaking. He speaks for the IMF in that Zoom encounter. So I I'd like us to have a discussion on this where we break it down to the barest minimum for the ordinary person to understand where it is that we are currently when it comes to our economy and our talks with the IMF whilst we seek that uh, three billion deal. Mr. Iwa, I know that there were some seven pillars that were put out by the finance minister. We'll go through them. But the fourth pillar is building strong financial institutions, for which reason I'll start with you on this. And for many who have bonds, they are investors. We have external and domestic you know, investors. We know that no agreement has been reached in the area of the debt operation parameters as put out by the finance minister. But really, paint a picture to us about what our financial institutions look like as we speak. We've seen that report by APSA and what they are projecting in terms of how much the CD to the dollar will be looking like at the end of the year. They say about 12 CDs amongst others. People have their investments in your institutions Right now, listening to you, they want to have an understanding of what happens to these, you know, investments they have. So paint that picture to us. Be frank with us and let us know what exactly the situation is. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, Emifa. Um, the minister couldn't have put it any better that um, during these uh, periods such as this, um, we need stronger, resilient and uh, banks um, that have the capacity to engineer the growth that we are looking for. Um, it is the time that uh, when banks are even making huge profits, we should be excited about because this is the time for banks to build capital buffers. Um, as economic uh, turbulence happens, uh, sometimes the, the risk factors don't crystallize immediately. They are always in the horizon mm. and uh, banks should be able to prepare for that eventuality and have the capital levels and the necessary balance sheet to be able to accommodate the shocks when they do okay. And I say when, not if. Because uh, the economic distress that we are witnessing now is at the household level, at the business level, and at the country level. At all three levels, the banks are impacted. The banks have fund funded um, the, the individuals and households. The banks have funded businesses. And the, the banks have, as you said, funded the government um, um, in the area of um, uh, our exposure to government securities. So everything must be done to ensure that we have stronger banks that can accommodate any potential distress from businesses and any potential distress from households. And in our case now, in our discussion now, any potential distress from the state or the distress from the states that we are dealing with at the moment. Um, to paint a picture, I would say that uh, banks are strong. Uh, we have the right liquidity levels at the moment. Um, the capital levels are within regulatory um, limits. But I would also say that the environment has not been good for banking. Uh, we've had over 35% depreciation of the currency. Um, when that happens, there is a, a stress on bank capital because we are foreign currency component of our balance sheet and we report in the local currency and that immediately transferred or translate into a stress on um, capital levels. Um, we've also witnessed an environment of such accelerated pace in uh, growth of interest rates. And when it happens and you are a bank, you are exposed to interest rates or instruments that were issued at the time when interest rates were in the regions of late teens and early 20s, and all of a sudden we are talking about interest rates in the region of upper 30s, um, immediately as a bank, you have a challenge of uh, mark-to-market losses. 
And once you record mark to market losses, um, and the direct impact is not on your profitability, but on your capital. And capital is a live wire, it's capital and liquidity. If you lose it, you don't have a bank. So we have to do everything to protect the capital of the industry. We have to do everything to ensure that the industry is liquid. You would also recall that not too long ago, um, the central bank came out with some emergency measures. And one of the measures was an increase in the cash reserve requirement of bank, banks. So it, already banks have that extra layer of distress in terms of additional liquidity that is being squeezed out of the banking system in an attempt to arrest inflation. So we need to do everything, as, as I said earlier, to ensure, and here I'm quoting the minister, that we have a stronger and better financial system, both during and after these IMF um, discussions. Mm. Well, there are, there are key questions that uh, we'll be raising because there are questions I've seen about if we have a bond, for instance, in these financial institutions, should we be expecting a call from government, for instance, during this whole process? Because we are doing the debt sustainability analysis so far. We've seen the rankings and the World Bank website, the risk of external debt distress and risk of overall debt distress. These are high, very high. And uh, we've seen some debt sustainability analysis done by Imani. We've seen that of the NDC also mentioned that what it looks like is just not good on paper and uh, we are yet to experience it and people have started experiencing it or talking about it already but dr chumisi um you've been listening to the finance minister put out these seven pillars where we are in terms of these talks and the outcome of it and hoping that we'll have some sort of a deal that will be reflecting in the budget that will be announced or put out in november tell us really where we stand in all this. I'm sure you've been following these whole talks with the IMF amongst others. Tell us where we stand. You'd have Thank to you, unmute. MFA. Super. Yes. Thank you, MFA. Um, I believe that, um, like the finance minister indicated, um, it's as evidence based on the macroeconomic indicators that all is not well in Ghana. And for that matter, um, they have sought for assistance from um, the IMF. But um, for me, um, I do not want to um, send us all the way back, uh, but to put the discussion in context, um, when you look at um, uh, our historical um, path in terms of our journey with IMF, um, Ghana as a country, you see that the indicators that always make us um, go in for a fund-assisted programs have not changed. Currently, we are looking at um, unsustainable debt levels. We are looking at um, a currency that is depreciating. Um, that is also putting a lot of pressure um, on a balance of payments. And so that means that in our ability to import essential um, commodities like um, petroleum, um, pharmaceutical products, and items that are not produced in Ghana, we are consistently um, in a, um, a tight situation. And for that matter, um, they have had to approach the, the fund for uh, assistance. But how did we get here? You see that when you look at the, the debt composition of Ghana um, currently, um, we have a blend of domestic and foreign debts. And when you look at historical antecedents as well, um, prior to HEPIC, um, the, the very famous HEPIC in 2001, um, we saw that at the time our debt levels were also quite unsustainable, 145% um, uh, percent in terms of debt to GDP ratio. So we had to go um, um, for HEPIC. And this was at the time where Ghana was a lower income country. Right, so we qualify for debt forgiveness because most of our debts were um, concessionary um, loans, where our debts were by with bilateral agencies. So you could be forgiven in terms of your debts. So after HIPEC, you see that um, um, when you come down all the way to 2006, for example, our debt to GDP was around 26%, which was a very good place um, for the country. And then you come all the way, uh, we rebase, and then we came to, in 2018, debt to GDP was at 
57%. Why do we make a lot of emphasis with debt to GDP ratio? It's looking at prospective investors want to look at the potential for the, the government to be able to pay back its loan. And so your ability to generate wealth is an indicator that you can pay back. And that is why the debt to GDP ratio is critical. So when you look at this, you see that we attained um, a lower middle income um, status in 2011, thereabout on the back of oil discovery. And you see that now the country no longer um, qualified for most of the bilateral loans and concessional um, loans and grants as well. So the avenue was to go onto the international market for us to borrow because um, now we have the muscle to be able to do that and explore. And we've done that over time consistently. And you've seen that the market has responded positively. The downside with um, um, opening yourself as a country on the international market is that you become also quite volatile because your country is an investment avenue for both domestic and foreign investors. So there is always speculative activities that are going on. People are keenly watching your macroeconomic um, fundamentals to be able to take a decision whether they want to invest or not. And that is where rating agencies in recent times have become quite critical in the discussions because they are looking at the indicators to make a projection to put um, prospective investors. And certainly, um, when you look at the, the consistent bad ratings that Ghana has received based on the back of rising inflation, depreciation, and the accumulation of the debt, it is a situation that um, Ghana has been cut out of the international markets. And with the rising inflation, you also see that um, the central bank is rightfully also increasing the prime rate to tighten the space and reduce the rate of inflation in the economy. With the central bank doing that, you also see that it, is, uh, it leads to increases in interest rates, and that increases the cost of borrowing of governments. Mm. So on one hand, we've been shut out of the international financial market. And then on the domestic market as well, government has had to borrow at a very high rate. So you see that there is not much room for government to maneuver than to go and seek for policy credibility, which was also one of the reasons why we approached the IMF in 2015 as well. So I am giving all these historical antecedents for us to know that, yes, indeed, the structure of the economy is not changing. The fundamentals consistently remain the same, um, but it, it appears that um, um, we seem to consistently hope for, for the better. Rightfully, we should, but I believe that policymakers ought to get to work as we enter into this program and also moving forward so that indeed, this is our 17th time, we don't find ourselves in the situation we find ourselves in right now. And currently, what is making it even more dire is the fact that the, if there's a, um, the government has to restructure the debt, and given that domestic debt constitutes the largest chunk of government debt, it is rightfully um, um, so that government needs to look at the domestic um, markets in terms of restructuring. Which people are the holders of government debts on the domestic market, the financial sector, and then households? So for me, um, the, the issue is that whatever it is, um, there would be um, some, uh, some people, some people would lose, uh, let me put it that way. But I also like the Some fact people that will are, lose. W w which people would this be is, is the key question. And lose exactly. what? What exactly would they lose? Okay, so in terms of debt restructuring, um, the laws could come in the form of government negotiating with um, um, debt owners that um, they would have to probably cut down on some of the interest rates. Uh, I'm sure you've had discussions about haircuts, for example, that is receiving less than the market value of any assets that you own, right? But for me, also looking at um, the, the history of the country, the restructuring should be done in such a way that households are insulated from, from um, the, the adverse possible effects that would happen. And given that 
the finance minister has also committed to um, a robust financial sector. Um, we are quite keen to come out with the innovative ways in which um, government would want to restructure the domestic debt. It possibly could come with um, a negotiation in terms of extension of maturities, um, which is also something that is done. So if your bonds or your treasury bills are due next month, government could renegotiate with you to pay in two months, right? And possibly um, not pay the going interest rate at the time. All these are avenues that exist. But as we go through all these, we need to be careful that um, households' incomes are protected. Particularly given that Ghana, we struggle with a lot of Ponzi schemes in the financial sector. If people have confidence in government and they have invested in government, I believe that the responsibility is on government to protect their, their savings. And for that matter, I'm quite passionate about the households component, the individuals, in terms of um, who are the owners of the debt in the domestic, um, what do we call it? Um, Hmm. Well, but that said, I'll come to you, Mr. Jinapo, but briefly, let me clear this with Mr. Iwa on this, uh, with that picture that has been painted in terms of our financial institutions amongst others and these haircuts. I don't know how low the haircuts will be, but the concern is with all that we know so far and some of the banks that we've heard, um, at least we've seen their projections amongst others and the concerns that has been raised amidst this debt restructuring. Finance institutions, at least banks, we are told, may be the largest hit in all this. And you, you say that you are hopeful that our banking sector will remain strong, will not see collapses like we saw in the past. Is that what you say? You are hopeful? I am I am, I'm very hopeful. And that is why I would like to take the minister's word for what it is, that... Um, in whatever arrangements... Yes, we've heard the shape. minister's words, but you are there on the ground, okay? You are there on the ground. You lead these bank associations, like you lead these bankers or these banks, so to speak. What really is the situation um, such that after this debt restructuring, we'll have our banks intact as a country? Is that what you say? Yes, I, and, and I, I agree with you on the point that you have just um, um, raised. And... Uh, when people talk about protection of households, I agree 100%. We must also know that it's the same households who own or whose deposits the bank has given or the banks have given to the, to the state. Mm -hmm. So if you save the banks, you are saving households. So we cannot take one and isolate it from the other. The banks, apart from the capital levels, if you pick any of the banks, the bank with the, the largest capital level in this country, maybe is just a little about a billion Ghana cities. But they have huge investment in excess of 80 billion Ghana cities with uh, the state. Whose money is that? It's depositors. And who are the depositors? It's households, individuals, businesses. Mm -hmm. So anything that goes to also frustrate the balance sheet of the banks and the capital levels of the bank in a manner that results in uh, uh, you know, a, a banking system that is not resilient and is not strong enough to absorb any shocks should also be avoided. And that is why the minister said what he said. He is an investment banker. He understands these things. So I, do, I don't want to jump the gun because um, we all know, they said, in the discussions, they have not got into debt operations. They have not got into the level where we are talking about Haircut, and in, uh, these days I, I, I don't even want to turn on the, the radio because people are talking about haircuts as though we go to the salon to just have. It is <laughs> huge. It is big. And let's not just use it loosely. It is uh, 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 it's like somebody owing you and saying, I can't pay your money, but you come for your money. I gave you 10 CDs now, I'll give you five. It is, it is that big. And we need to be very careful how. We contextualize this discussion. Will that not be not, the reality at some point that we should brace ourselves uh, for? Of course. And, and, and I like what uh, my uh, fellow panelists say about various forms of uh, restructuring, restructuring is available. We have uh, a, a, a debt extension, maturities are on, in the horizon or are coming up. Uh, you can have a situation where you have extensions to this, but those are soft levels of restructuring. Yes, they have liquidity implications because banks plan their liquidity. 
uh, they know that maturities are coming and they have liabilities that those maturities perhaps are going to sell or service. So um, if maturities are unduly extended, it could also have impact on liquidity. And we believe that when we come to that, the central bank can then perhaps create a window for the banking system and say, if you have been asked to maybe do an extension of your maturities uh, uh, so that we are able to reach debt sustainability, if as a result of that you have liquidity needs, we from Bank of Ghana will step in to support the bank requirement. I think that is perhaps an, an avenue that we should explore more and perhaps come less on these um, discussions around shaving off from the portfolio. Mm. But in all this, though, curious, what's the role of the Bankers Association in all this? Um, we, we, we are playing a very critical role. Um, the bank, uh, the central bank or the Minister of Finance will not be engaging individual banks. So uh, we have a community of banks, and that community of banks is headed by the association, which I happen to, to head. Mm -hmm. So we are really at the forefront of any discussions with the banking industry. We, uh, we need to be able to bring individual bank situations to the table. There are, there are decisions that can be taken that Bank A can accommodate, but Bank C or D or F will struggle to even take 50% of it. We need to understand the dynamics of the industry, and that is where we come in, to provide that kind of understanding of the industry dynamics, where banks are uh, from the tier one to the tier threes, where each of them are, so we can properly situate the discussions and take decisions that are optimal for the banks and for the country. We have to reach, as the minister said, a win-win situation. And reaching that win-win situation is understanding, we understand why we are where we are and the discussion from that side. Uh, there's not much to understand from that side. Mm -hmm. But there is that end of the banking industry, uh, the pension funds, the asset managers, uh, the household uh, holders, the offshore holders. There are, we have the insure, insurers, who also put insured money or premiums into government bonds. So there, if you go and do a haircut, it's going, going to affect their ability to pay, pay claims. So these dynamics all come to the fore so that we can have a more forward-looking discussion that seeks to protect the interest of all participants and not uh, maybe solve one problem and create a lot more problems um, for the industry. Mm. And I talk about the banking industry because of what and where we are coming from. Okay. We just come from a market where confidence went to all time low, where banks went under, banks were consolidated. And we do not want a situation where after any program of a sort, we are going to have to deal with that situation where we have to bring, uh, be building back confidence in the banking system. Mm. And I believe that the managers of the economy have these backgrounds to their discussions and they understand it. And from the initial conversations that we've had, I'm quite confident that the understanding is there. And we need to just come to uh, a decision point of how we mm. deal with it. But let's not forget, it's not just about uh, 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 debt. It's also about expenditure. It's also about revenue of the government. So debt sustainability is not just a debt, I mean, uh, but why do you have a debt? Because you are borrowed to spend. So you need to look at what do we spend our money on? Mm. What can we do? What else? I know that uh, we've cut a discretionary spend by 30%. What else can be cut? On the revenue side, we know that there are leakages. We are just heard of a news article on Joy um, of a customs, you know, leaking the state about 300 million, I don't know whether it's dollar or CD, um, annually because of just oil import from the sub-region. If we have pockets of this in the system, to what extent uh, are we going to have all coming to the table? We close out these loopholes, so the, the kitty becomes bigger, the expenditure side goes down, mm. and, and then we you know, begin talking about what else, whether we have to even touch the debt 
um, and that is being held by the bank. I, I was hoping you, you let us in, actually, on what exactly uh, you've been told. That gives you that kind of confidence in what um, has been said. But I'll come to you again on this and also uh, Dr. Chumisi on this. But let me come to the studio now and bring in uh, Mr. Jinapo uh, on this uh, particular IMF um, situation. He's also on the Finance Committee uh, of Parliament. And we've been told there's an extensive engagement the Finance Minister mentions as he puts out uh, the seven pillars and tells us that before he comes to you in Parliament in November to present uh, the budget for 2023, hopefully some form of a deal would have been agreed on uh, with the IMF such that it will reflect in the budget. First of all, I've heard a lot of these things from the finance minister, from the chairman or head of the economic management team, several assurances that we keep deteriorating. And so, Rather than talking too much, I think they should focus on the job. We've had several assurances. Quite recently, the finance minister held a press conference and gave us the same itemized issues and gave us so much assurance, it turned out to be negative. The vice president himself has done that, it turned out to be negative. And so it's not enough just talking. And I'm happy that the... Bankers Association says that they appreciate the cause of the problem. What I see is that the current managers of the economy do not appreciate the cause of the problem. And until you appreciate the cause of the problem, it's very, very difficult to prescribe some solutions to that problem. Because when you hear the excuses they are given, it, it, it just makes you feel that, look, this economy is in the wrong hands. It's true, we met the finance minister. And, and I was one of the people who were chosen. We were, were quite few mm. from Parliament. We met the Finance Minister in Koforidia, and I can tell you that this economy is really sick. It's, it's worse than they even try to tell us. But that's good news. At least there's some engagement with your position. For instance, government is not just dealing with this by itself. So let me is deal it? with the issues. Okay. Now, if you look at the Ministry of Finance's own report, on the fiscal side, our total revenue for the first two quarters was 37 billion. That's total revenue, all the revenues accruing to the state. And normally when you are looking at this, your emphasis is on the tax revenue. Tax revenue was 30 billion. Meanwhile, when you take two items, compensation and debt servicing, it's 42 billion. So the total revenue is not even enough to meet just two line items. That is debt servicing, which is interest and amortization, and then um, compensation. Before you then come to look at get fund, NHIS, district assembly, come up, all the other statutory payments, when you put all together, it's about 60 billion. So 37 billion against 60 billion tells you the difference in terms of the amount of money we need to even reach par. Mm. Bearing in mind that there's no opportunity for you to go to the euro bond. So it's a serious matter. And our information is that because they are not getting the revenues, the Bank of Ghana is hard to support. And so by the end of the year, all this liquidity support the Bank of Ghana is giving would crystallize. And the state would have to absorb that or make provision for that as part of our national debt. Other than that, the Bank of Ghana would have to make provision for that in their balance sheet, which will also knock them off. So this is a really, really serious problem. And in Koforidia, we give a lot of advice to the minister. Inflation is now at about 34%. I mean, who can survive such a condition where inflation is about 34%? And the bankers themselves tell you, the cost of borrowing now has gone through the roofs. The currency is depreciating at an alarming rate. And so clearly, things are very, very, very difficult. The question is, what do you do going forward? Who will be meeting the IMF, the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. I think on the 5th of this month? And so far, we have indication that the IMF is now coming to agree with some of the things we talked about. For instance, the Sinohydro facility. It's almost due for payment. We don't have any bauxite processed into alumina. 
We don't have any aluminium. And in this sector, you need minimum three years to put up a factory. I mean, we are nowhere near that factory. So this will crystallize. It's about six billion. Energy sector debt of about 10 billion. It's obvious that I've checked from the logbooks. They don't have any significant money to pay the principal when it's due. And it's due, I think, in 2024. So we have to make provision for that. That's about 10 billion. Cocoa Bolt, they have a debt of 14 billion. They cannot service it. As a cocoa bills. Mm -hmm. They have to make provision for that. Get fund. 2.5 billion. When you put all that together, that's about 32 billion, which is very likely to hit the public debt. If you take what Bank of Ghana is doing, and then all these bills I'm talking about, when you put them on the national debt, it takes us to more than 100% GDP versus our debt. The debt would go beyond the GDP by about 100%. So there's no doubt that you will restructure your debt. I can understand. The Bankers Association, they are very worried. And I heard Madame say that, look, there will be some level of restructuring. Because the money is not there. And no, some of these debts are maturing. And even when you take our domestic debts, a chunk of it is owned by foreigners. You see, in the US, they use nationality because they deal with dollar. We use currency. If it's CD, we say that it's domestic. If it's not CD, we say it's foreign. But we allow foreigners to bring their dollars to convert it to CD denominated bonds in Ghana. So we took 2.5 billion from Franklin Templeton, converted it to CD bonds, and our currency stabilized. So the stability we we're realizing was because we always go to borrow money artificially to put it in the economy, and then you are seeing some level of stability. But now that the international market is closed, those dollars are not flowing in again. So you see your CD depreciating at an alarming rate. So even those with domestic bonds, when you pay them the coupon or interest, they go to the Bank of Ghana and say, look, I want dollars because I want to repatriate the money. So clearly, we are in difficult, difficult moments and debt restructuring is inevitable. The question we should be answering is, how do you restructure the debt? How do you deal with the were domestic component? Were you giving that indication when you met the family? Oh, we were principal. clear that we think that it would be suicidal to focus only on the domestic side. Well, what these banks do, principally, as, as, aside other things they do, is to mobilize excess liquidity by pooling deposits together and then advancing them to a deficit unit mm -hmm. in the form of credit. And so a lot of the monies you see sitting in their balance sheets are from depositors, like myself, and you. So I give, say, 10,000 CD to my bank, expecting that maybe in six months, I'll get, say, some 10% on it. So if government decides that the banks should take a haircut, either you extend the maturity period, reduce the principal, reduce the interest, extend the interest, but any way you look at it, it means that the banks will have to take a hit. And if you look at the debt or credit portfolio, the banks have a substantial amount of money with government. The banks cannot do anything than to tell their depositors of customers that, look, I'm taking a hit here. So you must also take a hit. If you reduce my deposit in the bank, you know what is going to happen? I say, fine. Hmm. If my 10,000, I can't even get my 10,000, it's 9,000. Give my money to me. None of these banks can withstand a run. If there's a run on the banks, most of them would fold up. So for me, I think that the Ministry of Finance should be engaging all the stakeholders on how to deal with the debt in terms of the restructuring. Because the restructuring is inevitable. Is this same person the back and pretending that all is well that has brought us in this mess? So let's agree that there are real difficulties. We may not be able to service the debt the way it ought to be. And that something ought to be done. But I we told the minister that the minister is so fixated on the revenue side. So in the ensuing budget that we're going to witness, I can predict that there will be some taxes. Mm. Look, there is going to be very difficult moments for us. Because he needs to mobilize that revenue to address the expenditure situation. How is he going to do that? More taxes up to how many of them? So how is he going to raise that revenue? If, if you don't restructure the debt. And the debt component is a huge amount. 
I think it's about 35 or, so, or, or about 30 billion. I'll check it, both interest and amortization. And it's due. You have to be paying it. What do you do? You have to raise the money somewhere to pay or to tell the debt holder that, look, I cannot pay you now. I mean, there's no other way. I owe you, say, 50,000. I have to pay you by end of October. My salary is just 10,000. There's a 40,000 deficit. What do I do? Meanwhile, I cannot borrow. Because look at the rates now. And the more you increase the rates, the more the interest component, which makes your debt service more expensive. So what, what can the minister do given the circumstance? And this issue about IMF, look, the IMF is not for the Christmas. That's why the IMF is engaging. I know they've made GMPC. They've made all the energy sector SOEs. They are meeting us. They want to have a true picture of Ghana's debt situation first. Mm. If you don't about have this, the second meeting that the committee is going to have with the IMF team, at least we know that they had some pre-engagement with you in the second meeting. What would you say as you sit here? You're a ranking member. Um, you're going into that meeting with what exactly, you'd say? I'm clear in my mind that we'll remind the IMF that we raise these issues with you. Mm. Debt, that is the, na the nation debt or national debt, but the Minister of Finance has decided that he won't treat it as such. So you have something like energy sector levies debt. Yeah. The debt in the energy sector, he's formed what he calls ESLA PLC, a special purpose vehicle, with no money, it does no balance sheet. And put the debt on ESLA PLC. How does ESLA PLC pay for the debt? From the revenue section of the budget. Because when you look at the budget, it's basically the revenue section and the expenditure section. The revenue section, you see ESLA receivables. He's supposed to pay for that debt, but he decides that it's not our debt. Get fund. He goes to borrow money in the name of get fund and decides that it's not our national debt. So that is the key issue we are going to raise with the IMF. That we are in this mess because we don't even have a true picture of our national debt. And that it's imperative that we have a true picture of the national debt so that all of us can prepare. Sino Hydro, they told us it's butter trade. And that we're not going to pay with our money. We we'll process bauxite, bauxite into alumina. It's time to be a fiasco. And the vice president was championing this. We cautioned them. So sometimes when we speak, it's not as if we are naysayers. I mean, knowledge that, does not reside be, in yes, one person's head. Mm -hmm. Today, the chicken have come home to roost. And we have to make provision for all these issues. So we have told the minister that look at the expenditure side as well. And it mentioned that there have been cuts. Um, no, no new vehicles are being bought. We are told about unnecessary travels, at least in the last, just that we were not giving details as in how much exactly we've been able to make Thank or keep out much. of uh, that expenditure cut. Thank but you. we are told there are for it, yeah, We asked for details. We've been seeing them traveling up and down. And Who is it's travel? necessary, they say. Which one is not necessary? So tell us the travels that were not necessary that you cut. So does that mean government was already engaging in travels that were not necessary? Is that what they are telling us? That now all of a sudden they've realized that, look, some travels were unnecessary. How much savings have you made from that? These issues of so-called vehicles. We're going to receive the reports very soon in Parliament. And what I'm seeing is that they are still procuring vehicles. All they say is that necessary vehicles. Who determines what? They should rather look at the size of government. When I was a minister, MPA, MPA. We had no deputy. Today, there are two deputies. In some corporations, they have three deputies. Doing what? Three deputies? Even members of parliament. I hold the view that if I had my way, you would reduce the numbers in parliament. Mm. 275 for a country like Ghana. 200 people, in my opinion, can do this job. And when we talk of government size, it's not just the ministers. Those toughest and hangers on and all that. And the president himself must demonstrate that he is prepared to cut down on expenditure with these luxurious and unnecessary private jets and all that. So clearly they should lead the way. They should reduce the level of expenditure. They should show austerity, show a level of committed, trim down the size of government. Then we can follow. But I'm clear, look, there is no... It's, you don't need a magician. You don't even need an economist or a finance person to tell you that, look, next year things are going to get very, very, very tough. 
things are going to get seriously tough for all of us. Already, salaries have been increased by just 4% in 2021. 2022, by just 7%. Meanwhile, inflation is at 34%. So if your salary was increased by 7%, but the cost of buying items, on average, is increased by 34%, you can see where you find yourself. And even with all this, we're still not making solutions. Look, we had pollution levy. We had COVID levy. We had financial sector levy. We had energy sector recovery levy. We had a e levy. And when you look at the reports, almost all these levies, aside e levy, have overperformed their projections. In fact, when you take the price stabilization and recovery levy, it's gone up by about 400 percent. COVID levy about 130 percent. Mm. Financial sector levy about 130 percent. All of them. So even the revenue side, it is the e levy. That's really impacted on the revenue side. The others are doing fantastically well. And yet, look at where we find ourselves. Mm. Look, this economy is in tatters. This economy is in a quagmire. And I think that the finance minister and the head of the economic management team, Dr. Baumia, should spare us this lengthy, lengthy lecture and talks. But there's been transparency they at least at the deal last. With the issue head on. And let's wait for the IMF to finish this consultation and we'll get to know the true state of Ghana's national debt. Mm. Well, Dr. Chimisi, as part of this uh, debt sustainability analysis, I don't know if you also agree that uh, debt restructuring is inevitable. But really, how do we go about that debt restructuring is the concern for many. Um, if you were to uh, consult with the IMF, for instance, or consult with government, what really will be the way to go for you, you would say? Okay, so um, given that now Ghana is basically cut out of the international financial market, um, we have to um, restructure. It's, it's something that needs to be done. And when you look at the sustainability um, requirements for IMF uh, program, um, you see that um, for you to be able to qualify for any fund assistance, you have to prove that you are on a path to be able to sustain your debts. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I think that um, it has to be done tactically. And I would side with uh, Mr. Iwa in a, in a sense that, yes, Householders, um, households are the owners of the resources in the banking sector. But we also know that there are individuals that invest directly in treasury bills through the commercial banks, right? The, the, the challenge we find now is that because of the very high interest rates in Ghana, um, truth be told, a lot of our commercial banks and financial institutions are also too comfortable investing in government instruments, right? So now you see that the problem has been compounded in the sense that most of these institutions are heavily invested in government instruments. Some are invested in government domestic instruments and they are also invested in government foreign instruments in the form of euro bonds and other um, financial um, instruments that are um, introduced by government on the international market. So anything that is done that hits them, um, now some of them will take the hit on the domestic markets. And we know that going to restructure foreign debts have very dark consequences. So if you can do it at home, you bet charity begins at home. For me, I think that there are pensions funds, mm -hmm. there are um, assets managers, um, manager institutions that are also quite invested. Um, government can um, start the restructuring with those institutions in the sense that um, those institutions all also have liquidity that is coming in consistently. So probably there will be room on their balance sheet to maneuver. The reason why I am insisting that um, individuals, that is the households must be protected in terms of those that have directly bought government instruments is that if 
um, such people lose, then it means that what is all the noise we make about Ponzi schemes? What is all the noise we make about um, illegitimate investment instruments in the economy? If after all, um, you lend to the safest borrower and you end up losing. And that also has implications in terms of um, the savings habits and the culture that will come after us. So for me, I think that um, the negotiation should be with the institutions in terms of, for example, extension in maturity, negotiations on interest payments and, and those, and um, so that um, people are not significantly um, hit in a negative way. Well, restoring and sustaining uh, macroeconomic stability is, is key uh, for the finance minister from what uh, he says. But he's hoping also that by November, before he gives us uh, budget estimates for the year 2023, we should have reached some form of a deal with the IMF such that it will reflect in the budget. Looking at the Zambian situation, at least, we followed what happened with Zambia and how long it took. We are told we are going to be putting together a five-member committee also as part of our debt sustainability analysis. Do you foresee that we are able to reach some form of agreement by November with the IMF such that we'll see it reflect in our budget. Dr. Chumesi, then I'll come to you, Ms. Ewa. I, I think that it is um, um, looking at it from a very optimistic point of view because, I mean, we are in, um, we are entering October um, with tomorrow and indeed... That we the, are in October is, actually oh, today. Sorry. <laughs> we are in October. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so indeed, um, uh, the, the time um, frame is very short, um, but... Um, the, the situation we find ourselves in, looking at the challenges on the revenue mobilization side and the fact that on the expenditure side, there is not a lot of room to maneuver in terms of um, debt servicing requirements and remuneration to um, uh, public servants and all that. Um, it is imperative that we get some solution in the shortest possible time. And I think that is what is informing the opportunistic um, view from the, um, the finance minister. Mm. I know you're very optimistic with building a strong financial institution. Are you that optimistic also about we reaching some form of a deal with the IMF as we look forward to that Ghana miracle by November, such that we'll see a reflection in the budget? Uh, yes, um, it's a tight one, but um, earlier the better. Um, the financial markets, if there's one thing that the financial markets almost hate, is noise. Then our noise, uh, you know, <laughs> expands when the, 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 the space to maneuver is elongated. So as, as quickly as possible, if we can come to an agreement, it will be in the interest of the country. Um, between now and um, November, we only have... Oh, no. It appears uh, I have a cracky line there to uh, Mr. Iwa, but I think we didn't get to... Uh, tell me how hopeful you are about we reaching that deal before November. Uh, you think that is possible? We, we, you're hopeful that can happen? Well, that depends on government's cooperation. For instance, the IMF would require a lot of information. IMF would have to do some level of validation. Mm -hmm. And then government would also have to prove that it is on the part of debt sustainability, which is to say, this is your national debt. This is how you ought to be servicing them. Mm -hmm. How are you going to service that debt? Okay. That is a question that the IMF would wish to Get seek clarification mm -hmm. or answers from Ghana. Because the books are showing now. You talked about the Zambian situation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Ghana, a lot of our debt are owed to commercial entities. A lot of Zambia's debt was due to bilateral. For instance, about one third of the external debt was attributable to only China. So... If you can deal with China directly and China says, yes, I agree, I can push it for you. It's a sovereign nation. It has a financial muscle. Mm -hmm. So you can deal with them. But when you are dealing with commercial entities, shareholders are interested in their profits. So it's not that straightforward okay. with the situation in Ghana. So it would depend on government's ability to prove that we are ready to make some cuts. Okay. We are ready to raise these revenues and show realistically Bearing in mind that in the past, when we've given all this assurance to investors, Ghana has failed. Mm. Because throughout 
2021, all the assurances that has been given has not materialized. Mm. But when we meet the IMF, we want to be very, very bold, very blunt, very straightforward with the IMF. But of course, our, having our Ghana's team. interest also at heart. Exactly. You know, like Thank okay. you very much. Okay. And it's in, it's, it's in the spirit of national interest that will be very honest, very blunt, very sincere with the IMF when we meet them. Okay. Dr. Chumisi, um, I don't know if we have uh, missed a while back because there's this key issue also about these Momo loans that I was hoping uh, to pick his thoughts on. But uh, do yes, I have you? I'm okay, back. super. I have you back on this. So you are telling me about your hopes about reaching that deal in, in November. Yeah, as I said, um, I'm quoting the managing director of IMF. Um, he, she, he stated that a deal is possible before the end of the year. Um, as for November, it's extremely optimistic, uh, but we should all put our hands on deck. At the end of the day, uh, it depends on uh, how many areas of contentious uh, points do we have to negotiate. If we are able to narrow down to as few as possible, then a deal is possible in the shortest possible time. Okay. So it all depends on what guest uh, is going to be discussed um, at, the, at, the, at the table. And I, I'm, I'm quite sure if we don't go uh, with a lot of conditionalities on, on what IMF can touch and not touch, and we go saying that we are ready and willing, if it is about expenditure cuts, if it is about programs that we have to stop pursuing, about revenues that we have to remove from the staff source, it's about a debt uh, operations that we have to handle in this way or that way. If we can come to consensus within the shortest possible time, yes, then the deal is possible um, uh, before the budget is read in, in November. But I must say that it is extremely tight. Okay. I'll come to Dr. Chimesi, but let me wrap up with you, Ms. Ewa. We know that uh, this week, um, as part of uh, the SIM registration, I should say last week, as part of uh, the SIM registration, we're told up there by the Bank of Ghana, there was a communication that came uh, from the Bank of Ghana that those who've taken Momo loans and are abandoning their SIM cards, hopefully um, they will not be tracked. But we, we were told by the Bank of Ghana that uh, they are on the heels of these persons, really. Is there a role that um, the Bankers Association are playing in all this um, for us to be those um, who have taken Momo loans and are hoping to abandon their SIM cards and um, not be found, really? Uh, what's the situation? Um, thank you very much. Uh, at the, the, the directive from the Central Bank or the notice is a step in the right direction. We commend uh, the regulator for coming out of that uh, directive. Um, as a country, we should all um, 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 take keen interest in improving the credit culture uh, we have in this country. Uh, we should get to the level where if you are unable to pay your rent, you should not have access to a, a bank facility. And that is how it is done elsewhere, that your credit exposure should be such that, uh, just like we are discussing for the country, individuals must also understand that they have a duty to pay back. That is your number one um, obligation if um, you, you, you owe anybody, whatever money you get, your debt should be your number one. So um, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, one day I was out of uh, uh, the house and my people at home called me, uh, the lights have gone out because the credit is finished. I said, well, let me send you something on your mobile. And they said, oh, don't send you this number. Uh, please, I'm going to give you a like, different number so you, you send to the boy in the house. And clearly, he had borrowed on that and he feared that if I transferred to that account, um, it would be consumed by the debt on, 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 on that. So who should pay? Which, who should pay for that debt? We should have that responsibility as a people that the culture we create is what creates the space for more credit creation. If people take the loans and they don't pay back, who will we get the funds to give the next loan? So we commend uh, Central Bank uh, for bringing this as an industry, we also have a payment platform. Uh, we have the Ghana Pay, and we do not want a situation where people take facilities of Ghana Pay and decide that uh, we are going to change our SIM and uh, we will not have to pay back um, um, that debt. We, we all, from, from the security man or the professor, we must know that we have a duty to perform on our facilities. Just like as a country we are struggling, we should not let it translate into individuals and households also behaving in the manner um, um, as though we take facilities and we don't want to uh, um, pay back. Okay. And that is why, as an industry, we also support this SIM card registration. 
if we get to the level where we can pin people to this ID, and if you borrow on say Ghana Pay and you dish your 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 your, your SIM card and you go for um, Vodafone, and we, it's the same ID, Vodafone would know that you are defaulted elsewhere, and therefore you're not a credible customer. We will okay. not give you the facility. Okay. We have to get to that, point. and that is where I think the Ghana Card registration. Uh, will take us to. Okay, well, so we know, um, just in wrapping up the discussion about the IMF talks, we are entering the next lap, which is the next five days, uh, with the IMF team, World Bank team. So, seven pillars uh, that were put out, debt sustainability analysis, the fiscal consolidation, strengthening our monetary and exchange rate policy. We know we are building strong financial institution, microcritical structural reforms, also maintaining peace and security, and economic growth. I'll give the final words uh, to Dr. Uh, Chumesi. So these are the strong pillars, the pillars that uh, the finance minister put out that we are dealing with. Your final thoughts, and then we can wrap up on the IMF talks, then we can get into uh, the next uh, discussion on news file. Dr. Chumesi, for obvious reasons, I give you the final words. Thank you, Omefa. I think that when you look at all the um, seven um, itemized um, um, indicators, you see that they are rightfully um, interlinked. Their sustainability is critical for uh, macroeconomic um, stability, and that means that we need to consolidate the fiscal space. Indeed, I must say that um, we are in this critical times because over the, the, the period when you observe the pattern of monetary policy and fiscal policy, you don't seem to, or the market doesn't seem to appreciate that a lot is being done on the fiscal side. So monetary policy consistently has been tightening the space because of um, the fact that inflation is increasing. But when you look at the fiscal side, um, you cannot really pinpoint um, innovations, initiatives that government is taking to be able to cut down on expenditure. So fiscal consolidation is critical um, in this discussion. And then when you look at um, in terms of um, other indicators such as um, strengthening the monetary and exchange rate regime. Mm -hmm. um, when the um, uh, indicators are right, inflation is controlled. Um, we will see that there would be um, the, the city will gain some some momentum in terms of um, its rate against other initiatives. So for me, uh, going into this agreement, I also think that you see that Ghana always all the time performs under an IMF program. Mm. So, um, but the challenge is the moment we exit the program, then the cracks begin to emerge. And you find that the, the foundation of that is that we, have, we do not work at the structural challenges that need to put the economy on a sustainable growth path. Okay. So going into this, hopefully, I hope that we will learn lessons and then um, um, get to work to make sure that the structure of the economy changes and probably in another four years, five years, we don't come to sit here um, discussing about another um, I am IMF. With you. We're, we're grateful. But, 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 mm -hmm. but, yes, I know you are, you are winding up. Uh -huh. These seven pillars uh -huh. that you've mentioned, haven't you heard them before? These seven. What's new here? What you tell me? Just, if Dr. Kansa, these seven pillars that we are now being told will resolve our challenges. Have we not That's what we are working towards. Over and over? To, to, to so what is new with these seven pillars? That's what we want to hear. Must it be new? Must it Pardon? be new? Must it be new? Ah, then it's the same old thing. Okay. So we must know these seven pillars. When you say this, what does that mean? What are you mm. going to do? What anchors that seven pillar? If you just come and put out your seven pillars, Anyway, you want to wind up. So I'll take a quick break here on News File. And we've been talking uh, with uh, Dr. Prisla Chumisi Bafos, the department of, she's at the Department of Economics, University of Ghana, also uh, the president of the Bankers Association of Ghana, Mr. John Iwa, and in the studios, Mr. John Jinapo is the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee. He will stay with me and keep me company uh, in the studios, and we'll get into our next discussion on the GNPC Gensa deal. It appears there's more also that he's been talking about, 1.5 billion. Uh, that's what uh, it looks like. There's some financial loss 
uh, to the state has been caused. We've been hearing from government on this, maintaining that um, the CSOs, that's ASEP, Imani, they first mentioned this. Um, they could be misleading us, but we have all the details right here on Newsfile. Please, we'll take a quick break. Stay with us. Too premature for me to come to conclusions. The only thing which is a sore point for me is that I was thinking that before Imani and Asep were put out into the public domain, matters of this consequence, they should have made those matters referable to GMPC. That this is what we found, what are your comments? And they will incorporate their side of the story into the report. They didn't do that. So for me, it is too adversarial for comfort. The agreement between GNPC and Gensa, uh, which is the subject of uh, public interest, I think that it is important we, we understand it. Uh, some of the headlines uh, you read uh, are not factual, you know, and they do not help. When you have done analysis, so-called independent analysis, you need to put it against the facts. And the only way you can get the facts is to talk to the institutions that are involved. Otherwise, uh, it, it can be misleading, and uh, people will form an opinion on uh, misleading uh, statements. And this is why I am very happy that Parliament has shown interest in this. Our Parliament is a very responsive Parliament, and the Committee of Parliament, the, the Mines and Energy Committee, uh, has met uh, with GMPC and the Ministry of Energy, who provided all the answers they they, they want for the questions uh, relating to the allegations that have been made by Imani and, and, and Asset. And uh, uh, we know that they are going to scrutinize uh, this agreement and the questions we have answered, the answers are going to be uh, put to test. And then in due course, the nation will be informed. Welcome back. You're still here on News File, here on the Joy News Channel, also on Joy 99.7 FM. We are on myjoyonline.com and our various social media platforms. I have seen a number of your messages. We'll be going through them shortly, but it's a good time to start the second half and in terms of our discussion uh, on the GNPC Gensa deal. And we've heard Imani, we've heard ASEP on this, and we've been hearing from government. We've been hearing uh, Deputy Minister in Charge of Energy, uh, Mr. Amin Adam, they're disputing claims some claims that has been made by the CSOs on this and we know there's been some meetings also with the the Mines and Energy Committee they are here to meet Ghana Gas and then meet Gensa they've met GMPC also but let's um, kick start the discussion and this half I still have Mr. John Jinapo with me uh, the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee in the studios also via Zoom is Vice President Imani Africa, Mr. Bright Simmons. I also have the Executive Director, Africa Center for Energy Policy, Mr. Ben Boachi, also with us. And uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen, uh, to Newsfile. And it's a pleasure always uh, to have you. Let's test uh, the microphones and be sure we are ready. Um, uh, Mr. Simmons, how, I hope everything is well. Yes, I'm well, Emma. Thanks for having me. Mr. Ben Boachi, thank you um, also for joining us. Mr. Ben Boachi is there. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Thanks. great. So, uh, as always, we'll start this discussion with a, a presentation from Mr. Bright Simmons. As always, I know you have a thing or two to say about a thing or two. So, please, uh, you take it away. But whilst we all listen to Mr. Bright Simmons, as he takes us through uh, the few slides that he has, please listen with an open mind. And then while you do, if you have any concerns or any questions, please feel free, as always, to send us through all our social media platforms. Then once he's done with that 15 minutes presentation, then we can put the questions and then continue with the discussion. So Mr. Bright Simmons, uh, take it away. Th thank you very much, Emefa, for uh, giving ASAP and Imani the opportunity to lay out these issues um, for that understanding of your audience. So if they will bear with me, I'm going to proceed to try and give us a little bit of context, then I'll delve into this issue of why we think um, this agreement between GMPC and Gensa will cost Ghana $1.5 billion, and why we think that the agreement is unconscionable, and what is the larger put, uh, uh, context within which these discussions are having. So you will recall that many years ago, well, not that long ago, maybe five, six years ago, we had a big power crisis in this country. What many people do not know is that a big difference between then and now 
is that today Ghana has its own gas reserves and gas production. So in those days, we used to depend on gas that came from Nigeria through a pipeline. And when we didn't have gas, uh, we had to resort to the use of light crude oil or you know uh, petroleum. So essentially, the stuff that when we refine becomes petrol, we used to put it in the power plant to generate electricity. The important thing about gas is that it's cheaper because it burns faster. So instead of using light crude oil, if you use gas, you can actually have or even um, reduce your cost to maybe one third or two fifths or something like that. So gas is cheaper than using oil to produce uh, electricity. Of course, the cheapest will be in some, in most instances, uh, using uh, dams, hydroelectric dams. So large bodies of water that turns the turbines. But when it comes to thermal production, the use of fossil fuels, gas is cheaper than light crude oil. Now, so when you have gas, particularly gas that you don't have to spend dollars to buy, then the pressure on you as a country being able to address energy demand is lower. That is why now that we have domestic gas, we have less of a problem with doing so. I'm not saying it was the only issue. I'm saying it's a very important issue. So that gives you a context of what this whole natural gas discussion is about. Um, the next point is that the Ghana has about three sources of gas. All of it is outside our uh, land territory and in our sea bed. So in essence, you have Chinebua, uh, Enira, uh, Ntomi, which is one gas field called 10. You have Jubilee, and then you have Sankofa. Sankofa gas is already dry, so we normally don't process it. And it comes by a pipeline on the land. That's the one that you can see right on the yellow, the yellow uh, dotted line. Then you have um, Jubilee and Tain gas, which is mixed with water. So we bring it to the shore. And we have some place called Aboaze Processing Plant, where Atuabo, sorry, Atuabo Processing Plant, where we dry that gas. And then we transport them by pipeline to various power plants and other consumers of the gas. So that's how our gas picture looks like. Three major gas fields, all in the sea. Uh, one source of gas has very little water, so we can use the gas almost as us. And another gas is filled with a bit of water. It comes mixed up with the oil, so we have to dry it. Once the gas is on the shore, so you can see that we have gas coming from Nigeria as one major source, also from overseas, and then three domestic sources. They land on what we normally call receiving facilities, and then you transport them in mainstream pipelines. And other uh, uh, buyers of the gas, or what we call off-takers, can connect smaller pipelines that we call laterals to come and take off some of that gas to distribute to endpoints. A lot of this infrastructure is owned by Ghana Gas. A lot of the pipelines you are looking at is owned by Ghana Gas. It spent about $1.6 billion of Ghana's money, government money. Uh, some of it raised through loans and equity and, and things like that to construct all these pipelines, to get the gas from the sea, uh, send them to power plants around the country. And then we now have some buyers who are beginning to build their own pipelines to connect to the main trunk uh, pipelines so they can take some of the gas to their own facilities. In a, you know, an institutional environment which is functioning properly, um, there shouldn't be overlaps and uh, turf wars among the key parties. It should be very straightforward. GMPC owns some of the gas because Ghana, by virtue of the fact that this is in our territorial waters, have a, an automatic share in the gas. So we get a percentage of the gas as ours. Uh, on top of that, we also negotiated with the producers of the gas. That as for gas, unlike oil, we needed almost all of it uh, at no cost. But that is a completely separate discussion. When the gas has been collected, GMPC also buys some of the gas, and particularly in the area of Sankofa, and very soon all of the other fields, and it becomes there for the national aggregator. It buys, you know, it's the commercially responsible party for the gas that is produced offshore. GMPC, as I already mentioned to you, owns the pipeline infrastructure, and therefore it's more or less the distribution utility. We want BOST to do that, but BOST doesn't have enough money. So BOST is not playing that role effectively. So GNGC continues to be the main distribution for, uh, utility in Ghana. And when the gas, so basically GMPC gets some of the gas for free, buys some of it, passes it on to GNGC, uh, and then it's supposed to go to the power plants to use to produce electricity uh, in Ghana. Along the way, you have regulators who are supposed to be watching every level of it. So at the production point, that is essentially where the gas is being pro produced. You have the Petroleum Commission, that is the main regulator. Then you get down to, you know, to the downstream where the gas is actually now being transformed into power. And there are two main regulators there. One of them is concerned about how you use the gas. So the power plants, the pipelines, all that infrastructure that allows you to utilize the gas. 
The other is concerned more about the economic implications. So the pricing or the customer, the customer service, the quality of service. PURC is the one that's concerned about the economic factors. And then the tanker factors are in the purview of the Energy Commission. This was a very broad context to give you an understanding of what we are talking about when we say natural gas, uh, et cetera. The other important part is that uh, this company called Gensa that we're going to introduce, it's one of the thermal power producers. I've already mentioned that we have some producers who use hydroelectric dams, Akusombo. They are not a thermal producer, power producer. We have some that use solar and, and other things like that. So these guys, there are about 15 major companies in Ghana that uses um, fuel, fossil fuels like crude oil or gas to produce power. Today, almost everyone uses uh, natural gas. This thing that we are talking about, this commodity that we are discussing on this show. Only AXA still uses HFO, but even AXA is building a pipeline so it can start to use uh, gas. Of these, there are two companies that are interesting. You see them at the bottom. One is called Gens, the other is called Trojan. Unlike most of the other producers where when the power has been produced, they send it into the national grid, discharge it to Gridco, and then Gridco sends it to all of us. These particular players, they tend to put their power plants close to the customers, and the customers tend to be large customers. We call them embedded generation companies. So this Gensa company that we've been complaining about, ASAP and Imani have been complaining about, is one of the two main embedded generation companies in Ghana. Here is the issue that we are complaining about. We are arguing that the cost, or rather the price of the gas that has been made to or offered to Gensa is atrocious. So in 2020, Gensa signed an agreement with GMPs, and in 2021, July, it um, amended that contract. In the first agreement, it was told, or rather it was offered um, the opportunity to buy gas from GMPC at $2.79 per unit. Don't let the numbers and those things confuse you. It's pretty simple. Think of $2.79 as, you know, just $2.8, you know. So every unit of gas, let's think of the gas almost like a, you know, a, a barrel that you put in the gas. Uh, every, one, every one of those units cost $2.79. Then in 2021, July, 2021, July, as I said, they renegotiated to reduce the price if Gensa builds some pipelines that will enable distribution of the gas to some customers at yet unspecified. And they said if they did that, then the cost of the gas or the price of the gas to Gensa will go down to $1.72. That is the most important thing for the viewers to keep in mind. These prices of gas that you know Gensa is buying the gas at $2.79 or $1.72. In order to put those numbers into context, this $2.79 or whatever. You can look at, okay, how do other producers of electricity who use gas in Ghana, how are they buying their gas? So the biggest producer of power in Ghana, as you know, is VRE. We've all known VRE for years. VRE buys gas at the price that the regulator in the economic segment that I mentioned to you earlier, PURC, sets it. So for, for most of the period that this contract between Jensen and GMPC had been operational, uh, VRE has been buying gas for around $6.08. So bear that number in mind because it's very important. And then how much is the cost of gas reflected in the cost of power eventually? Almost 60%. So when you look at the numbers, almost 60% of the cost of the power that we are receiving is the cost of gas. That means that when you set the price of gas, you affect the cost of power very dramatically. And that's a hugely important economic fact to bear in mind. The other point to also notice, is as I try to describe the infrastructure, uh, the institutional framework to you, I showed you the rules of each of the parties. Ghana, uh, Petroleum Corporate, Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GMPC, uh, is responsible for procuring the gas. GNGC is more responsible for distributing the gas, but it's also a wholesaler and on-seller. And even though GMPC sells directly to the power plants, traditionally, GNGC was supposed to be a major wholesaler in between. And it buys gas from GMPC, and, and it's a state-owned company. And the price at which it buys gas, if you look at the, the, the volume and the value and you divide, you see that the price at which it buys gas from GMPC is about $5.4 because it's a major wholesaler, right? Buying in the middle. And that's also an important point to keep in mind. Keep in mind that even though I'm talking a lot of numbers, these are very simple numbers to bear in mind. We have a private company that has cut a deal to buy gas at about $2.79. We have state parties that are buying gas to on-sell or to use for production of power that are buying it at $6.08, $6.08 or $5.4. GMPC's own calculations when he went to PRC to try and convince PRC to increase how much it's able to charge industry players 
was that it cost it around $7.9 in 2022 for each unit of gas. So that's an important point. The regulator looked at all those numbers and decided that, as far as it was concerned, the fair price for gas in Ghana, if you want to buy gas, should be $5.9. So you want to buy gas and use it to produce power in your power plant, it's very simple. Go and buy the gas at $5.9, but that would be a reasonable price. Remember that that's still lower than what GMPC thinks should be a fair price for other or the most, uh, uh, its its largest base of customers. Why is G GMPC uh, doing this? So what is the argument? And remember that, as you pointed out, there's been a parliamentary inquiry, and so we've heard the arguments that GMPC has made. Uh, and we've also seen the letters that GMPC has written to the energy ministry justifying all of this um, discrepancy. And this is a massive discrepancy. We are talking about gas that you know state-owned companies are buying being discounted by almost 70% for a private uh, owner, a private operator, power plant operator, who produces much less. And normally, if you buy more, you get better discounts. So why is someone producing very little of our power getting so much discount? This is what they say. They said that, well, this is somehow a very major enabler of our industrialization. So it deserves something called the industrial development tariff, as opposed to the normal price, because it's helping us to industrialize as a country. That argument was made to the Energy Commission, which, remember, is the one that determines how gas is used. They have, they have expertise in the systems that produces power, so the power plants, the pipelines, etc. And GMP, uh, the Energy Commission listened carefully to these arguments and concluded that they didn't see anything unique about Gensa, for which reason it should get uh, charged for gas at any price lower than the average one that the PURC had announced, what is often called the weighted average cost of uh, the commodity or of gas, so WACOP. So that average price that the regulator said is about $6.08 at the time that we were having these discussions. And before that, it was even higher. Don't also forget that Gensa had already agreed with Ghana Gas to buy gas at $7.29 if it doesn't get this concession, or $6.5 if it gets this concession. And it was in order, in order for uh, Ghana Gas to sell the gas to Gensa at $6.5 that Ghana Gas wrote to Energy Commission so that Gensa could be classified as some kind of industrial sector enabler in Ghana, some company that is helping industrialization in Ghana. And the Energy Commission disagreed. This was in 2019. Soon thereafter, as I've mentioned to you, GMPC agrees to sell the gas at this massive discount to Gensa. Now, is it true that Gensa really is enabling Ghana's industrialization? You can simply look at what it uses the, the gas to achieve. When, when it produces the power, where does it go to? Is it going to factories that are doing manufacturing or to logistics hubs? or free trade, uh, free zones, export processing zones. No, the gas that Gensa gets, it uses to produce power that it sells to mines, mostly gold mines. These are rich companies, and they are important companies, but they are not in the industrialization strata or spectrum of our development. They are, prime, they are in what we call primary extractives. They are the kind of producers that we are trying to convince to do more refining here. So if the power was being sent to refineries, gold refineries, bauxite refineries, and the rest of it, then you could make an argument that this is a, a company that is aiding industrialization. That is not the case. It's sending most, almost all the power to mines. These are its customers, its list of customers, uh, 14 major customers, mm -hmm. all of them uh, mining companies, almost all of them gold mining companies. These are rich companies. Should we be undercutting other producers of gas and discounting the price of gas massively so a private company can sell gas to rich gold mines when we already complain that we don't make enough from gold in Ghana. The other argument that they've made is that, oh, Gensa, unlike some other buyers of the gas, deserves a special treatment because it's built its own pipelines, whereas the others rely on national or public or state-owned pipelines. But that's also not really true because we have companies in this country who are also building pipelines to collect some of the gas to power their, uh, their plants, like AXA is building a pipeline Trojan is building a pipeline. Early Power is building a pipeline. These have gone through the regulatory process of getting Energy Commission approval to build pipelines. So there's nothing unique about um, Gensa building pipelines. Secondly, even if it's true that the pipeline issue was that important, the fact of the matter is that we have ways we price the contribution of pipelines to the overall uh, price, uh, cost build-up. And that amount is exa an example of that. We have Ghana Gas compares the cost of gathering gas, the cost of transmit, uh, processing the gas, and the cost of transmitting the gas through pipelines. So when we look at that, we get an idea of what will be a reasonable discount if because you are using your own pipeline, we want to give you a, a rebate. That's less than a dollar. 
So even if you know you didn't want to charge them the six point zero eight dollars because they're having their own pipeline, wanted to discount it. You shouldn't discount it below five dollars, right? So to take it all the way down to two point seven nine dollars, and then to say that if they build more pipelines, you take it down to one point seven two dollars, doesn't make any sense. The G GMPC argues that they will use some of the gas lines of Gensa for free. And they've used that as a very major argument consistently. But that's not true because in the agreement that they signed in July 2021, they clearly say that they will charge something they are calling the gas compression charge. So it's not for free. They will charge GMPs for using those gas lines. Uh, at the end of the day, though, the important point is that it's not as if Gensa has built its own pipeline into the sea and is collecting the gas into its power plant and wants that cost to be offset. A lot of the gas comes from offshore in public owned or uh, state funded pipelines. And then even the main trunk of pipelines are still state funded. So the little you know, or the short distance that you know Jensen may collect the gas and travel over does not warrant these massive discounts. The other argument that have been made is that oh Jensa actually pays his debt on time and we are struggling to collect our money from the likes of VRE and others, obviously because of the under recoveries we have in the power sector. But those arguments are also not true because Gensa actually does not pay its bills on time. We have evidence, as I've shown you, that Gensa is owing and has been owing GMPs for quite a while. So in 2021, at the end of 2021, payment outstanding to GMPs was about $4.6 million. This is money that Gensa had not paid at the end of the year. So they are getting their gas at a massively discounted price and they are still owing. Hmm. On top of that, we also know that you know it had issues with Vitol and therefore they went to court and then the court had to issue an order against them for damages. And so it's not a customer that you can say based on their track record, they pay so well and for that reason you discount. But it's actually worse than everything I've said. It's worse because when we actually look at the data, so if you look at this as GMPC accounting data, you find out that they are not even paying what they claim they are paying. So they say they are paying um, an industrial development tariff, which will be $4.2, and then they've got some discounts. And then if you use the contract as the basis for the discounts, it should be $2.79. When we actually look at the GMPC data, they are paying $1.114. One, one, uh, $1.114, $1 right? So $1.11. That's actually how much they are paying. Now, that is shocking because it means that even after signing a contract with them, that will have made it possible for them to pay $2.79. In practice, GMPC on its own has decided to apply additional discounts. But what is dramatic is to look at what the other people pay. Look at what VRA pays, $6. Look at what Jintao, the Chinese company, pays, $6. And some of these companies, they pay in advance. They pay prepaid. So the government tends to owe them. Look at the two companies that are actually manufacturing ceramics and where we signed a special contract for them to resurrect the ceramics industry and we give them the energy price discounts as an incentive to manufacture ceramics. They are paying $4.2. What is special about Gensa selling power to gold mines? That should warrant a discount that brings it down from the $6.08 that the biggest power producer, government-owned company, VRA, is paying to $1.14. And it's frightening. Even before the contract was signed, they were already getting the $1.14. This is January 2021 data from GNPC itself, showing that it's getting $1.114. VRA is paying $6.08. Um, Wang Kang, which is a ceramics company, is paying $4.20. These are companies that we have attracted to Ghana to give them free cheap energy, like we would do with the bauxite producers when it come to, uh, comes on board, because otherwise they can't refine bauxite. They are paying 4.2. Why is a company that is on selling power to gold mines paying $1.11 1 a unit of gas or MBTU? And the arrests have not stopped. They are building up. So I showed you arrests for the end of 2021. Now, these are arrests for 2022 half year. They are already in arrest by a significant amount, uh, nearly $3.3 million half year. So, in short, when we said it's going to be $1.5 billion prospectively in terms of losses, when we look at what we should be charging GenSA versus what we are charging them, we've actually now confirmed, because remember, this is an ongoing investigation, that Ghana has already lost money. We've already lost money because we've been selling to them at $1.14 since 2020 onwards. And then from 2021 alone, if you take out you know, the, the cost of the, the rebates and all of that, 
you factor all of them into it, mm -hmm. you know, so we are being generous and accepting that this pipeline, they have deserve a rebate. Okay. You still come up to about $34 million to $45 million, depending on which price should have been charged them, instead of the massively discounted one that has been charged them. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, extend that to the end of this year, you get to a $100 million loss. If you look at the amount of okay. gas Ghana has committed to give them in the contract, the 228 million MMBTU mm -hmm. over the lifetime of the contract, and yep. you multiply by these losses, these per unit losses, you hit the $1.5 billion man. Mm. What is the broader context of this? Mr. IMF Simmons, if, if, I could, if I could come in briefly, Mr. Simmons, I, I, I would mm -hmm. wish that you wrap up on this. Then yes, the key questions, seconds. okay, so that the key questions have come up, then we can wrap it up on that as well. Indeed, five seconds to wrap up. What is the broader context of this? We are in the IMF to try to get a $3 billion. A bigger, one of the biggest contributions to our debt buildup, our liability buildup, is this energy sector. Now, it believed that we can hit $20.5 billion if we continue at this pace. Mm. How is it possible that a single contract GMPC signs with a single company, not one of the biggest companies in uh, energy production in our country, one that many people have not even heard of, can that single contract, single contract, cost the country $1.5 billion when this country is at the IMF trying to get a, a $3 billion loan? That's a simple question that we're asking. And we don't think parliament has done itself um, to, uh, you know, it's not covered itself in glory, at least some members of parliament, by seeking to undermine a very critical issue that we've raised uh, in the civil society movement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bright Simmons. And um, I would bring in Mr. Ben Boache uh, with ASAP as well, and then uh, Mr. Ginapo, uh, Mines and Energy Committee. Um, these are key questions. There are a lot of questions that we're hoping uh, we can get answers to uh, before we wrap up the discussion on this. But let me take a quick break. When we come back, then we can um, get into it. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. So $1.5 billion, uh, this GENSA deal, and we've been hearing from government on this. I mean, Adam says the CSOs are misleading us on this. Uh, this financial loss to the state that we talk about could not really be the situation, but we fell short of giving us details, actually, on why uh, the CSOs could be wrong. But let me bring in Mr. Ben Bwache, Executive Director of ASEP. I know these are questions I should be posing to government, but Mr. Jinapo is also here. Maybe um, they found out from GMPC and government, they got the right answers. But Mr. Bwache, really, does it make business sense to sell gas at a little over $2 when the industry averages more than $6 from the presentation that we've just seen? Why is GENSA getting such... Um, such windfall. Why is it happening? Yes, uh, MFA, thank you. But as we keep, you know, uncovering, and as uh, Bright indicated, the actual price that they are paying is one point one dollars, mm -hmm. right? So okay. it Not means that by the time we're even done, we could be giving the gas for free. And I will demonstrate that briefly. Uh, that we are essentially giving the gas to Agenda for free. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So a bit of more context to the discussion that we are having. So. Uh, Bright indicated that we buying the gas at an average price of you know, 6.08 at the time the contract was signed. But we do know that this gas is made up of other uh, expensive gas. So you have ENI gas you know, costing at the time around $10. Uh, so you commingle that with Jubilee gas and then you bring it cheaper uh, to about 6.08. And even in that is our attempt to sacrifice royalty. So Ghana doesn't get royalty from um, our uh, 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 OCTP field at this point. GMPC itself has sacrificed its carried and participating interest to be able to achieve the 6.08. So Ghana is already making a huge loss by achieving the WACOC or the market price that we have uh, at the moment. But even beyond that, GMPC is still struggling to pay its bills uh, to the OCTP partners. So if you check what uh, uh, the natural gas clearing house uh, indicated recently, uh, Ghana government has been assigned since 2020 about $732 million of you know, uh, payment liabilities for them to pay to subsidize the gas that is coming from our fields. Uh, government, government has paid about $600 million uh, already okay, uh, to support GMPC uh, on that. So we are creating a lot of waste uh, for Ghana government to absorb uh, in, the, in the energy sector. Mm. Just two weeks ago, ENI had to draw down 
uh, on our letters of credit to the tune of $180 uh, million dollars because GMPC uh, couldn't pay. And that is why it baffles us that with this uh, you know, horrific uh, you know, scenario, GMPC would decide to pick some of the gas and sell it or even uh, uh, give it out for, uh, for almost nothing. All right. So um, we saw the presentation that they made to Parliament, where now they are trying to tell Parliament that the discount that they are giving is the uh, 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 discounted industrial development tariff. And what we have seen from the contract really shows that GMPC at this point is only trying to find ways they can explain away the discount that they are giving uh, to Jensa. Because the contract is clear, as was shown by Bright, that they were giving discount on the commodity. On the commodity means that they were giving discount on the 6.08 price that the market uh, uh, was offering at the time. And it shows in the definitions uh, that before they construct and commission their pipeline to uh, Kumase, mm -hmm. the discount is 3.29, right? And after they do that pipeline, then the discount comes to 4.36. Uh, if we grant that they're even using the industrial tariff, which is 4.20, as was approved recently by the ministry, if you apply that to the discount that is in the contract, that makes the gas uh, negative at the end of the pipeline to Kumasi. Because if you deduct 4.36 uh, from the 4.20 industrial tariff, you are getting negative 1.16. Uh, All right, so that tells you that clearly they lied to parliament. And I, I would have wished that parliament could interrogate, you know, how the contract says they are giving a discount of 4.36, and they appear before a committee of parliament and say that we are applying the industrial tariff which doesn't really reconcile uh, 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 with the numbers. But again, let me emphasize that, as Bright indicated, Gensa is into an, a competitive market where they are selling uh, power to mines, mm -hmm. just as PRA is generating and selling uh, to everybody else, including the mines. As we speak today, VRA has lost 40 megawatts of the market to Gensa because they can't compete. Uh, ECG has also lost 20 megawatts of the market because they can't compete. And Jensa is creeping in and grabbing all the uh, big markets because we have given the gas to them essentially uh, 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 for free on, on this. So what we are doing and the manner in which we are propping Jensa, we don't fight the entry of the private sector if they can make genuine you know, effort to take up market without being supported by the state against other entities or other mm -hmm. uh, players in the market. But the way they are, we are doing it, we are setting them up against the state institutions and they're going to kill them essentially because they are gradually taking all the big markets from them and the state sits there and complain about excess capacity. I mean, if you have taken 60 megawatts, it means that VRA has lost 60 megawatts. So whatever the IPPs are generating and they cannot sell to the mines, the state has to find money to pay. So those calculations, we have not even gone there yet. If we go there to then begin to analyze the full impact of all these uh, uh, subsidies. We run into several billions mm. uh, uh, Ghana, you know, at this point. So, and gradually they are building to Kumasi. They intend to build a pipeline all the way to the eastern region, uh, Kibi area, to also supply uh, the mines over there. And it's the state that is providing uh, all these subsidies. So, if you look at all that is happening in the space, it, it appears to me that we are actually developing a Trojan horse uh, to cannibalize all the state enterprises uh, in the energy sector in the long run, all mm -hmm. right? And that shouldn't be uh, patronized by in independents like us, who are also interested in how the state agencies function. Even with all their difficulties, we have a responsibility to ensure that we do not add on to uh, uh, the pressures that they are facing by just uh, doing some of these transactions. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll come to, back to you on Zoom, Mr. Simonson. I, I, mm -hmm. I was just trying to end on this to also state that if you go through the agreement, you also find that there are other several agreements that may exist <laughs> that we do not know. If you check the pricing that um, Bright presented, where uh, it gets to 1.72 uh, 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 by the time they finish the construction of the pipeline to Kumasi and you unpack that from the agreement, 1.2 of that 1.7 is actually going back to Gensa for a new processing plant that they are going to build. So mm -hmm. that reduces the commodity price to about uh, uh, 0.57. Uh, 
all right? And that 0.57, we don't know how much Jubilee is selling the gas to GMPC. So just assume, because I know the Jubilee partners want about $2 for the gas after the foundation gas runs out. So if they sell it even $1, it means that GMPC is still going to make it loss on the commodity of about uh, 50 pesos, uh, 50 mm. cents mm. on just the commodity. And then Gensa processes it for free and gets the gas for free, and then we discount that. So by the time we finish unpacking this, the cost will be horrendous for us mm. to appreciate. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Jinapo, the closest to a GMPC response that we have so far is from your, your committee. You got to meet GMPC on this because it, it doesn't make sense at this point. We, we're trying to understand how VRE and ECG will be inched out to a private company, for instance. W what exactly is the reason for this uh, particular sweetheart deal from GMPC uh, to Gensa? And are you satisfied with the response that you got from GMPC on this particular deal? Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, let me commend uh, Brad Simmons and uh, my, my friend uh, from ESSEP. I recall when I was a minister, I used to have a lot of banter <laughs> with them. <laughs> Today, uh, I'm on the other side and I'm, I'm appreciating some of the work they do. When you're in government, sometimes you do not appreciate the work of the civil society organizations. That's why democracy is good. You step out of government, you observe, it gives you some thinking. And I'm convinced that next time we come into government, our engagement will be much, much different. Okay. So I appreciate the, the work that I do. Two, let me just clarify. Uh, right, I, I realize that you try to clarify again. The entire committee does not disagree with you. The fact that a member of the committee has stated something is not a true reflection of the position of the entire committee. Indeed, when this issue happened, I called Ben and sought to clarify some things with him. Then I called the chairman of our committee, Honorable Atachi. I respect him a lot. I told the chairman, this is beyond NDC MPP affair. Can we deal with it as a committee, as a fact-finding mission, and come to the conclusion? The chairman agreed. So the first point of call was to invite GMPC. GMPC appeared before us. Bright and Cole have spoken a lot. So I'll try mm -hmm. not to go into the technicalities. Our gas, when you take the raw gas, you have to process it. Even the 10 fields, even though like Bright said, it's much lighter. You do a little bit of processing. When you process then you give it to more of the power producers. So PURC has to ensure that when the gas lands, the price that you pay for is able to pay all those in the back chain. And there are three main elements to the price. The raw gas, the cost of processing the gas mm -hmm. and transportation. This three is what principally determines, even though there are some regulatory levies. Now we have three fields. Each field has a different price. So what you have to do is what you call the weighted average, like you do in finance work. So this is called WACOC, weighted average cost of gas. MFS gas is 10 CD, mm -hmm. mine is 15, another person is 20. But based on the weights, you bring all together and get a tariff or price that if all of us pay this amount, we can pay everybody. Mm -hmm. That is the 6.08 PURC says should be so the okay. minimum. So why so is when you tell somebody to pay something lower, it means that there will be a shortfall. So government then has to step in and pay that shortfall. So the questions are two. Is it true that there is a discount? Mm -hmm. That is one. Secondly, why do you give a discount to that company? Ghana can decide I want to give a discount to the ceramics because I want to reduce importation of tiles. It's a strategic economic decision, not a finance decision. Mm -hmm. The economies go beyond finance. So the first question was, True. why was Jensa giving the industrial tariff? That's what as a committee we want to deal with. And there's evidence that the economic management team directed Mr. Peter Mewu to write to Ghana Gas to give Jensa the industrial tariff, which is much lower than the PURC regulated tariff. That has been established. Okay. I mean, Jensa is a private company. I'm not after Jensa. I mean, if they get some good discounts, they want it. But GMPC and government must tell us what is so special that you would give that discount, first of all. You put them within the industrial tariff. We've seen some companies being put in industrial tariff. So why would you put this particular company within the industrial tariff bracket, which brings their cost low? Then I asked GMPC, 
you buy gas from the fields. If you put it together, this tariff you are giving to Jensa, will you be able to pay the partners? And if you are not able to pay, who pays for the difference? Mm -hmm. For me, that is critical. So why would Dr. Baumier's economic management team decide that they want to give those discounts? Ghana Gas is appearing before us on Monday. After that, Jensa will appear before us on Wednesday. I'm making an application, and I hope Bright and Co. will take it up to the chairman, that we should also listen to them. Because sometimes you learn a lot when you listen to all these sites. But, but I'm curious, in your preliminary meeting with the GMPC, these two key questions, did they answer it? They said, it's government, Dr. Baumier's economic management team, that directed them. Hmm. They wrote and they produced the letter signed by Peter Meu, saying that, look, give, put them in an industrial tariff. Hmm. So it's now shifting to the, the government. Why would government decide that you should apply that industrial tariff? It's something that government must answer as far as we are concerned. Then the GMPC one itself, the calculation they gave was 4.2. Mm -hmm. Is it beyond the 2.79? They say that there's a transmission cost and another processing cost, which brings it to 4.2, which is still lower than the current 5.9. But I raised the Kumasi one too. And they said, no, it's rather 5.9. I mm -hmm. said, so fine, give me the details. Give me the breakdown of the 5.9. I will take which portion constitutes the commodity, which portion constitutes the processing, and which portion constitutes the transmission. Then I'll put them in their various bands. They couldn't provide it there. So chairman then directed that he's giving them up to Monday. They should submit the breakdown for me. And I also asked the question, did you do an investment appraisal or an independent assessment? Because a company says that the pipeline will cost me X amount. What I would normally do is to do an investment appraisal to determine whether it actually beats that cost. They said they did something. I said, I want that evidence. They couldn't provide it there. Chairman wrote that should be provided on Monday. Okay. Then I said, did you go to PPA for approval? Because in signing contracts in Ghana, a covered entity under the Petroleum Public Financial Management Act at 91, if it's a foreign entity, you come to parliament. If it's a domestic entity, you go to PPA. They said they will find that letter. Chairman ruled that that should be provided on Monday. And then I raised another issue about the receipts. Because under the... Um, PRMA, that is the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, Act 815, Section 3. When GMPC takes this raw money, and the act is clear that all revenues are accruing from the state's interest, the first point is to lodge that money in the petroleum holding fund before you even transfer is as equity contribution. That's as far as I'm concerned, they couldn't satisfy that. Mm. Chairman has ruled that on Monday, all this should be supplied. So I'm clear in my mind what we are looking for as a committee and especially from the minority side. We, we are so clear, but you see, it's work in progress. Mm -hmm. And so Monday, Ghana Gas would also appear. Because Ghana Gas initially had the agreement with Jensa, April 2018, at a cost of $6.5 per MMBTU. 6.5. EMT under Dr. Bamia decides that Ghana Gas should leave the scene, GMPC should come in. Hmm. GMPC comes in, in GMPC's words, it goes to 4.2. So Ghana Gas is appearing. Why would you decide that that 20 year contract should move yeah, off? So GMPC. And now this should, look, it's, 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 it's very, very so, murky, very complicated. Considering how murky, how serious, in fact, more serious than we thought the situation is, whilst the, the committee is looking at it, shouldn't we be suspending the deal whilst we finish all this investigation? You see, I cannot ask for a suspension of the deal. Mm. And bear in mind, these things come with cost implications. The government came in power. There was a waggle deal for gas. They said because of take or pay, they abrogated the contract. Waggle went to international court and won $70 million against Ghana. Mm. The same government then turned around and signed another LNG deal with Tema LNG with a take or pay clause. And the price is indexed to the price of crude oil. So, we haven't listened to Ghana Gas. Mm -hmm. We are yet to even listen to Jensa. And I have a lot of questions for Jensa. Okay. I think that we should give all of them a fair hearing. Look, I'm not biased. I am not against any company. 
I want the best for this country. And sometimes mm -hmm. when we are doing this, people tend to attack us and give all kinds of names. It's even a learning curve for us. Let's even assume nothing happened. Okay. I would have learned something from this whole thing in terms of how policy decisions are taken and all that. So let me make a point that I, representing the minority side, we are determined to get to the bottom of this matter in a very fair and transparent manner. Mm. And we have our issues. We've, we're clear in our minds the issues that we want to deal with. Okay. When we get all this information, we would sit down and do the analysis. Not even just from the financial point, but like Benny said, if you sell to VRA at six and you sell to this person at four, the cost differential, who bears it? If VRA loses the mines because they are buying at six and company B is buying at four and they are more competitive than VRA, there's another cost element to all of those issues. Mm. And so we would deal with all these issues, bearing in mind that even the foundation gas is finishing this, this, this year. Foundation gas was two million, or, two million or so. That one is free gas from Jubilee. From January, you have to start paying for that. So if you can sign a long-term contract and lock yourself in, what happens? Mm. They told me that they had indexed it. I said, give me that evidence. So we would get all that, and that's how Parliament works. It appears you have like six documents you're expecting from GNPC <laughs> that, on Monday works. on this. Mr. Simmons, let me bring you in uh, on this. There are some who also say that could it also be that maybe GNPC and by extension government is just seeking to provide cheap energy uh, to these mining companies through Gensa? Well, that's the point. So if you want to provide uh, cheap energy to the mines, what about cheap energy to the hospitals? What about mm. cheap energy to the factories? What about cheap energy to you, MFA, uh, at uh, multimedia, your station? What would what be the basis on which rich gold mines, in a period where gold prices are going through the roof and they are making a significant amount of profits, what would be the, the, the national interest basis to single out mines and give them cheap energy? And make it contingent on buying only through one supplier. Because remember, there is nothing that says that if you are selling to mines, then this is the tariff. So therefore, everybody who can prove that they are selling to mines get a discount. For the mines to get this so-called discount, they must buy through a specific supplier, Jensa. Right? So this is a sweetheart deal any way you look at it. I also want to remind the Honorable Jinapo that they are not getting at $4.2. They are getting at $1.11. Uh, $1 no, so no, that's a no. significant Apparently, discount. You didn't get and, point. Okay. You. Can you listen to me? Okay. I said when GMPC appeared, okay. they told us that the DIDT tariff mm -hmm. for landed gas is 4.2. That okay. 4.2 doesn't go to GMPC. Because okay. then you have to break it down into the various components. And I said, give me the details of that 4.2. So that I would tick which portion constitutes commodity, which portion constitutes processing, and which portion constitutes transportation or transmission. And that was then not Then I'll given. have a fair understanding of what is happening. So, so it's you. within that context. Okay. Very good. Um, we just want to update the public that when you break down the accounting data, it's not as if they are paying to GNGC uh, some other amount, which then, when you complement it with GMPC, you get to even a reasonable number. The data that we've seen suggests a massive discount which currently is in arrest. So not only are they not you know, paying the full price for the gas compared to what others are getting, because if you remember the chart that I showed you, and I think this is so important that uh, perhaps I need to show you again so it's kind of seared in your memory. But when you look at that specific um, price point that uh, um, I showed you, mm -hmm. you will see that they had, we had comparative numbers. Right, and those comparative numbers gives you idea, an idea of how the other producers uh, are being discriminated against. So this this particular slide, um, sorry about that. Okay, we'll this try. This particular slide, you see that when you compare Gensa to VRE and to Jintao and to one kind of rest, if the if this price was broken down into the segments for processing, transmission, and the rest then the others would have been too. You see what I mean? But you see that Gensa is paying $1.1, VR is paying $6, the two ceramic companies are paying 4.2. So this is comparative. So, so let's forget about anything else. All of them may be paying separately. We're just looking at the 
cost to what they are paying to GMPC, the cost of what they are paying to GMPC now. And we have the national, the biggest power producer in the country, state-owned VRA, paying this amount. We have three companies that are industrial companies and in areas that we are trying to incentivize, like bauxite and the rest, which are high energy consuming, but also energy uh, uh, employment intensive, to so create a lot of jobs. On what basis is some companies selling to mines going to justify that they need a bigger discount than VRE, which is selling to hospitals, to the poor, to all the other social factors that we have in this country and which we need to take into account? I see, that, I see no reason on earth, you know, based on which you can justify that someone who's 14 customers are primarily gold mines, deserves cheaper energy mm. than either industrial establishments or the national public utility, who, remember, bear the social cost of having to sell energy to all of us who don't have money. You understand my point? Mm -hmm. So that's the key point. Secondly, it's not as if they're, they're, they are paying their debts on time. They have huge arrears to GMPC as well. So that brings to, uh, to, 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 it brings into question the notion that perhaps this is a highly mobile, agile, private company that is faster than uh, uh, DRA and the others. And because of that, uh, some of these state-owned entities are unhappy that they are moving into their terms. That would be an efficiency argument. If, for instance, it turns out that Jensa was very fast, agile, and quick, and things like that, you can make the argument that, well, maybe these old, uh, moribund state-owned entities are unhappy that you have a company that is private and very agile moving into their turf, and that's why they are fighting back. But that's not the case. This is a company that is struggling to pay its bills to, mm. to GMPC. You mm. see what I mean? Okay. So we have really great difficulties mm -hmm. mm. trying to come to terms with, one, how any company that sells primarily to mines and therefore, that's nothing unique. We'll be getting that's cheap energy. Mm. Exactly. Okay. Well, but Mr. Wache, I don't know from what you know, but I must add that we've been, we made efforts uh, to reach the GMPC and government for that matter on this particular issue uh, when it comes to the discussion here on Newsfile has been unsuccessful. The reason why we do not have any representative um, from government and GMPC to give us a further clarity on this. So we're relying on that investigation that is being done by the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament to get some more information on this. But Mr. Benwachi, since you've been both working on this, let me find out if we know of any political risk analysis that was done for this particular deal. Hearing now that um, the blame is being shifted to the economic management team for this particular deal uh, to be arrived at. Um, well, that is not something we are aware of. Okay. And my suspicion is that, if, I mean, there isn't any serious document out there that really justifies all these discounts uh, that were given. Uh, ordinarily, even the 4.2 that they are signing to Gensa, it cannot just be at the wish of the energy ministry. It should be informed by proper industrial policy mm -hmm. of the country that defines that X, Y, Z sectors can have cheaper gas, cheaper electricity, and then the energy ministry applies the industrial policy. They cannot on their own decide that tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, Gentile is an industrial company and we are giving a discount. A company XYZ can qualify, others can. That creates significant distortion in our governance structure. And that is why you have all these discounts fly, flying around and the, 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 the bill goes to the finance minister to pay. <laughs> all right, Because there is no coordination to really examine the cost of the discounts that we are giving and the ultimate impact on the fiscal situation uh, of our country. And so you still have even some ceramic companies who want the same discount, they cannot get it because it is at the will and wish of the energy minister to give that discount. So if there is no policy document that takes the box to say, if you are producing ceramic, you qualify, then it is really at the mercy of the minister to decide who uh, really get uh, that kind of discount. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are seeing where a directive, we are told, is coming from the EMT mm -hmm. to segregate function between GMPC and Ghana Gas. And that directive says Ghana Gas will sell to industrial customers and uh, uh, GMPC will sell to power uh, uh, producers. All right. So if uh, uh, GMPC is supposed to apply that industrial tariff by selling to industrial customers, and you think that Gensa is all of a sudden an industrial uh, business. Why is you know, GMPC taking up that role you know, by selling gas to Gensa and not 
you know, GNG. So mm. what you are trying to do is that you appreciate that it is a power company, but you don't want to apply the tariff that applies to power companies. Let me reinforce a, a point that I forgot to make, MFR, mm -hmm. and that is that it turns out that Gensa sells the power to the mining companies at 11 cents per kilowatt hour, and therefore it sells it at the same rate that VR and others will sell to them. The only difference, of course, is that it's embedded. Even though you're buying it for cheap or getting it for cheap, they mm -hmm. sell at the same rate as VRA. Indeed. Indeed. I just got confirmation from the Chamber of Mines. So what that means, therefore, is that what we have is a pure state-enabled undercutting strategy. Somebody who has a lot of political connections is able to collect Ghana gas at a low price based on all these funny di uh, discounts and then go and compete with the state-owned enterprise who provides energy to the same end customers. Mm. Now, uh, now, now, and now I'm, I'm a, all the margin. Okay. Now I'm a bit curious than I was earlier. What really is special about Gensa? You both know the energy space, or th all three of you know the energy space more than most of us do. Is that the practice such that we'll have the economic management team directing GMPC, Ghana Gas, to give a particular deal to a particular company, this time a private company, unless there's a particular interest in that company? What really is special about Gensa? There's only one thing that conceivably someone acting in good faith could have looked at. And that was that it was raising a very large amount of money in the private market to build pipelines, one of which could have helped the bauxite strategy that we have as a country, mm. because they were willing to do that. But the problem is, uh, Ghana Gas has also raised money, and I have the asset sheet, the, what you can infrastructure, uh, a balance sheet of, of Ghana Gas in front of me. They've also raised money, also in the debt and equity market, to build similar pipelines, okay. right? So it becomes difficult to, you know, even when you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, to understand. But the general argument mm -hmm. is that we'll, they have we'll gone to the to private it. market, mm -hmm. been able to invest in pipelines, and so therefore they've taken some of the burden of the government. But this has not materialized. This bus size strategy thing is very much in the future. Why are they getting discounts already? And they've been getting discounts even before they raise money to do this, and therefore before they were credible. Okay. Ben, you're, you're trying to give me an answer to that as well. Then I'll come to yes, Mr. Jinapo. Let, let me even shock you the more. Is he... The, the agreement that we have, which discounts the gas, there are two phases. The first phase was to account for their investment from Pristia to Ninahini and the lateral lines that they have in Linda Enclave. So that is what GMPC was pricing at 2.79. The same infrastructure, Ghana Gas was pricing it at Waco. So if you check invoices that, you know, Gensa itself uh, produced uh, for the, the purchase of gas from Ghana Gas towards the end, of the, the transition to GMPC. They were selling at WACOG, right? So what that means is that it makes economic sense for Genstar to buy it at WACOG at the time. So why does GMPC all of a sudden decide that we can give a discount without any additional benefits? But you're told where the directive is coming from. You, you've heard where the directive so, is coming from. Yeah, of course. Then we have to interrogate whether, you know, the ENT really understood the raft of this conversation before uh, they granted that kind of um, uh, subsidy. Okay. But beyond directing the roles we know that a significant component rests with gmpc itself all right they did, i mean by that instruction we don't have even the decision of the emt mm. but we do have a letter of gmpc and the ministry referencing that directive but gmpc as a state institution is not supposed to be a stooge being directed to do anything they have also, to were the ones who economic justification the ministry trying to justify this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let, yeah, let me let yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so they have so, to produce so, economic justification for the entire rebate that they are getting on their gas because they are buying the gas at, you know, 10.3 uh, uh, and then others for free and commingling it to achieve the market price. Let, let's, so bring in Mr. Let, let's bring in Mr. Mr. Jinapo on this. He has um, an intervention. I'll come to, back to you on this uh, probe and whether it should be left to the Mines and Energy Committee alone. But really, you had an intervention. You see, my emphasis... It's on Ghana Gas, GMPC, and government. Ingenza is a private entity. They are looking for business opportunities. So asking yourself, what due diligence, mm -hmm. what are the issues that all these entities, state actors, knowing that they even interrelate with VRA and the rest, do before taking that decision? And I was talking about this letter, 21st August 2019, Industrial Development Tariff, IDT, of 6.5 MMBTU. To Jensa. This was signed by Dr. Ben Asante, where the minister, after Ghana Gas makes an application to the minister, 
I agree that yes, give them an industrial tariff. When exactly was this letter? This 2019. 2019. 2019. Yes, yes. Okay. Our reference yeah. industrial, we refer to the disputed gas sales. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So I'm saying that. What went into that decision by the government? Why would they take that? And that is key for me. Why would you, first of all, even decide that you want to put them on an industrial tariff based on what everybody is saying and I say? That's one. Two is that why would state entities request of Jensa to build a 20 inch pipeline when originally Jensa itself wanted to build 12 inch? They said, We want 12 inch. We'll buy our gas and give it to our customers. Then we decided that they should rather build a 20 inch in lieu of a so called bauxite mine that we intended building. Today, we are paying capacity charge for that pipeline when we are not utilizing it. What analysis did we do before requesting of Jensa to build a 20 inch pipeline? I, I was wondering they would have provided that analysis. They to couldn't. Your committee. That's why we are bringing Ghana gas. No analysis. They couldn't. I, I'm sitting here, they couldn't. So this is a serious issue. Is it part of the documents you are supposed to present? They are part Monday? of the six documents that I have requested. Hmm. And when uh, Ghana Gas comes to, we have a lot of issues. And I think that after this, we should bring all of, to, all of them together at one table so that those who speak across purposes... Do you think we, we should leave clarity. all this probe of this particular issue to your committee? It is not left to the committee. Look at what Bright and Co are doing. They are conducting a lot of probe. Hmm. And they are raising some new things today. I intend for At least you have oversight, to, so at to, least... To get that. But clearly, these are serious issues. Okay. Look, these are very serious issues. These are grave issues. And we intend, a minority side, to pursue this matter to its logical conclusion. And when we finish this, I think that the report should be made available for everybody. And I would wish that uh, Brian Simon and his team, Ben and Co., would agree. That's if the chairman agrees. Whereas I make the application to the chairman, mm -hmm. and the chairman will rule, so that they appear before us. Mm -hmm. And then we capture everything and then we have a fair appreciation of what is happening. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Simmons and uh, Ben, in wrapping up on this, um, I know subsequently we'll be talking more about this particular issue, but uh, hearing what we've heard so far, at least from the Deputy Minister of Energy, we've heard from the Chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee, we're talking about it being early days yet, amongst others. Do you see or do you think that this particular probe into this particular issue uh, should be left to the Mines and Energy Committee or we should be calling for an independent probe amongst others. W what do you suggest? Let's start with you, Mr. Simmons. Uh, so, in fact, four quick points. One is that this is a seemingly complex and therefore boring subject and we are therefore going to have difficulty mobilizing public interest. Therefore, we are very um, thankful to yourself, multimedia, to this particular program, to newspapers like the Herald and others who, despite the lack of interest, you know, attempted to shed light. We are thankful to the Honorable um, MP um, in your studio mm -hmm. um, for the work that he's doing at the committee level to ensure that we have a dispassionate analysis of these matters. Third point, um, we are also going to continue the investigation because the more you, un every time you uncover new evidence, it's more alarming than before. Um, and last point is that so far, GMPC and Gensa have not provided any rational basis on why a company that sells power at the same rate as anybody else sells power to the mines becomes an industrial enabler of Ghana and therefore is federal Ghana's industrialization, for which reason it must be given massive discounts, which eventually this country will have to find $1.5 billion to offset the shortfall in our finances created by this region. Not when we are at the IMF and trying to get just $3 billion over three years. Mr. Hmm. Bemwache. Independent probe, yes. or uh, should uh, be left uh, to the I committee. Mean, again, we, we are grateful for the opportunity, and maybe to add to Bryce's point, we at this point have to call on every citizen to be part of this conversation, because ultimately we are going to pay. All right, so we are sacrificing roads, hospitals, schools for this kind of waste that people are generating in the energy sector. All right, half year 2022, we had already done 1.4 billion of debt in the energy sector. And the gas is a key component of this debt that is being generated. And the Ministry of Finance is sacrificing everything for this waste because they want to keep the light on, to tell the light is on, right? But we have to investigate, we have to pay attention and be interested to ensure that we can cut this waste and redirect the investment into social good. Otherwise, 
I mean, we cannot have what we want to have from government as a people. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't leave that only to the committee. We will perhaps have to support them with some of the information that we need. And I think I'll be working with Bright on this to see if we can send specific questions that we want clarification from the yeah. state agents yeah. Yeah. Uh, on this so yeah. that yeah. all of us can follow through to make sure that Ghana uh, is saved from this uh, uh, unwarranted mess. We cannot have this hand on our neck. We have to have a competitive environment for everybody. If it's a private business, want to do genuine business, it must be able to compete fairly with state you know, agencies. You cannot cannibalize you know, state institutions just because somebody has access uh, to political okay. structures and, I mean, the state agencies can only fold their arms and watch. Okay, uh, thank you. We are grateful uh, for your time. I'll give you, I'll, I'll come to you shortly, but let me do a few messages. Mr. Bright Simmons and uh, Ben Boachi, Mr. Bright Simmons is Vice President in Mani Africa, and then also Ben Boachi is Executive Director for ASEP. We're grateful. This is not the last we're going to hear of this issue. We'll definitely uh, continue to track it, especially when the Mines and Energy Committee will be meeting um, Ghana Gas and Gensa, amongst others, on this issue. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, that today is also International Day of the Older Person and there's some statistics that we're getting from the Ghana Statistical Service revealing that the older elderly population, uh, 60 years and older, has increased almost 10 times in the past six decades from a little over 200,000 um, in 1960 to almost 2 million uh, in 2021. The older population comprises 43.3% uh, males and 56.7% females. The report further indicates that uh, 341,960 elderly persons are in ice streams. We know about this uh, public lecture that was held on Friday and um, we had the likes of Reverend Dr. Joyce Ai Esther Koba, uh, Mrs. Olivia Ducci and Professor Ifwa Hesse. Many thanks for that. And this particular lecture we'll be bringing you subsequently on the joy news channel but some of your messages this one from mama says it's fair enough if normal citizens disgustingly refer to us ordinary Ghanaians complain about hardship however any politician who wants to make capital of our hardship is an unprincipled opportunist lying in wait to come and milk uh, us drier Zelia is also saying, I don't understand why it appears we are in the cities. We in the cities are more concerned about the Galamsee than the people in the mining communities, <laughs> which are mostly villages. There's a disconnect in the narrative about Galamsee. Until we involve the locals in this fight, we are losing it. Little Tete says government provides insufficient info on how it is actually spending public money during the year. Roy King and some of the messages. Many thanks for sending them in, Mr. Jinapo. Um, and we're time is time. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. He's a ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee. That's it for today's edition of News File. A speedy recovery to you, Samson Ladia Nyenene. I am MFA Apau. We have the midday news live on Joy. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining me.